Chapter One of Fritz to the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. Fritz to the Front by Edward L. Wheeler. Chapter One. Madge. One bright, hot August morning, a cheap excursion was advertised to leave South Street Wharf, Philadelphia, for Atlantic City that lively little city by the sea, which is so fast growing in size and popularity as to rival the more noted of the Atlantic Coast summer resorts. A cheap excursion which is within the means of the working class is ever a success, and this one was no exception. It gave the masses a chance to escape from the overheated city for a small sum, and they grasped at it eagerly. Bright and early the ferry boat was crowded, and still there was no cessation of the stream of humanity that surged toward the river front. There were representatives of every trade in the city, nearly and likewise a mixture of several nationalities. There were young folks and old folks and little children. Then there were roughs, bruisers, and bummers, an indispensable adjunct to summer excursions, and all in all a heterogeneous collection of humanity. Just as the hot August sun peeped up over Jersey's sandy horizon, the bell of the boat rung, and the huge ferry boat began to move out across the Delaware toward Kane's Point, where connection was to be made with the railway. It was a noisy crowd aboard the boat, there being a good many roughs among the pleasure-seekers who were more or less under the effect of Dock Street soothing syrup, and who were disposed to have something to say to everyone. Among the passengers was a young lady of eighteen or nineteen years of age, who sat in the stern of the boat, seeming to have no friends or acquaintances. She was by no means unprepossessing in face, and was trimly built and dressed rather stylishly, compared to the others of her sex aboard the boat. It was not long before several of the roughs noted the fact that she was unaccompanied, and determined to know the reason why. Therefore, one lubberly, raw-boned young bruiser, with a freckled face, bloodshot eyes, and a large red nose, approached her and tipped his hat with tipsy gallantry. "'Excuse me, young lady, but may I ask if you are got company?' he asked. "'Plenty of it, sir,' the young lady replied, her eyes flashing. "'I do not know you. You'd confer a favor by not addressing me.' "'I'll do as I please, my gal. Don't you sass your cousin.' "'Don't you know me? I'm a full moon, solid mulligan muldoon I am.' Greatly annoyed, the young woman turned her head away without answering. This, however, did not abash the full moon, for he advanced closer and laid one burly hand upon the railing beside her. "'Now, see here, my beloved Miss Moriarty,' he began, but before he could proceed further, a floppish attired young Jew, with red hair and a hooked nose, stepped forward and slapped the fourth ward man on the shoulder. "'Yes, you bounce out, my friend,' he said. "'Dear young lady, don't vos want some of your tension.' "'Hello, who in the blazes are you?' Muldoon demanded gruffly, not offering to move. "'I are Muldoon. They're a solid man I am, and I allow, and I kick and lick any man on <coughs> their boat. That don't make any difference. Dot young lady don't vaunt you near her. And if you don't vos gone away, right quick, I'll throw you out. Dot's their style off an excursionist I am.' cried the Jew. Oh, you will, will you? You'll throw me out, eh? Me, full moon Muldoon. They're solid man. I'll have a kiss from the girl, and then I'll leave your Israelite carcass overboard for the fishes. And making a drunken lunge forward, he threw his arms about the young lady's neck, amid indignant cries of a crowd of bystanders, and attempted to kiss her. But he failed in his purpose, for she pluckily threw him off, and the next instant the Jewish-looking young man came to her rescue. Seizing the rough by the coat and trousers, he jerked him away, then with the strength of a Hercules, raised him from the floor and hurled him forward down the cabin stairway to the lower deck. A cheer of approval at once went up from the larger share of the spectators, and the Dutchman became the hero of the hour. Some of Muldoon's companions rushed to his rescue and found him doubled up like a jackknife and groaning over severe bumps. His rough usage, however, had evidently cowed him, for he made no attempt to show fight or create further disturbance. The young lady thanked the Jew, but that was all, until the boat grated up alongside Cain's Point Wharf, when she caught his eye and motioned for him to approach. 
"'If you will be so kind as to assist me in finding a seat in the train,' she said modestly, "'I would esteem it a great favor. "'Well, you bet I will. "'It is a pretty rough crowd for a young lady without some company. "'My name is Fritz Snyder. What is yours?' "'You may call me Madge,' was the quiet reply. "'Then Fritz took her little traveling bag, "'and they left the boat with the crowd, "'and boarded the excursion train which was close at hand. "'Being among the first to reach it, "'they had no difficulty in finding a seat "'and made haste to occupy it as the cars were fast filling. "'I reckon ash how you vas going to der seashore?' "'Fritz asked, having some curiosity to know. "'I presume so, if the cars take me there.' the young lady replied with a faint smile. Is it a nice place? Well, I don't know. I was never there. But I hear it was a nice place. You see, I was going there on business. I, I don't know if I stay long or not. A little more was said during the overland trip to the ocean. The young woman did not appear inclined to talk, and Fritz finally excused himself and moved to another seat. There is some things vot don't vas right about dot vimmins, he soliloquized. She is not going to der seashore for one object alone. I'll bet a half a dollar. Just ahead of him in the next seat sat two old ladies who were discussing that topic uppermost in their minds, spiritualism. One was a believer, the other an unbeliever. Pooh, you can't stuff such nonsense into my head, Marier, the unbeliever declared, taking a pinch of snuff. Spirits don't trouble me. That is because you have no faith, Mehitable. Now my Sammy spirit converses with me every day and night, and keeps me posted about the realms of eternal bliss. And when I ask him to appear, he comes before me as natural as life. Has he got that wart behind his left ear yet? Apparently a man asked in the front of the ladies, though ventriloquist Fritz was, of course, the author of the question. Sir! The spiritualist cried indignantly, I'll have you know my Samuels had no wart upon his person. But he had bunions, though, a portly old gent across the aisle seemed to declare. It is a lie, a shameful lie. I'd like to know how you dare cast your insinuations about one you never knew, sir. And Mrs. Marrier arose in her seat excitedly. My husband was a good moral gentleman. For land's sake, Marrier, do sit down, the other woman cried, feeling embarrassed. No, I won't sit down, Marrier declared. That old ball-headed pussy fabricator said my Sammy had bunions. My good woman, I never said anything of the kind, the portly party declared, getting red in the face. The old woman's crazy, another man seemed to cry. Crazy, am I? Mrs. Marrier cried, snatching up a freshly baked pumpkin pie from the seat beside her and holding it ready to hurl at the offenders. I'll show you if I'm crazy. Just ye open your mouths, airy one ye, and I'll show ye how crazy I am. Oh, I'll learn ye to insult a respectable woman who minds her own business. And the woman came off victor, for Fritz ventriloquized no further, and the passengers had nothing to say, having no desire to get plastered up with freshly prepared pumpkin pie. In the course of three hours the train arrived at Atlantic City, and before the ocean's blue expanse it billowed away to meet the horizon. The grand stretch of level beach was thronged with people, despite the pouring heat of the midday sun, and many queerly costumed pleasure-seekers were buffeting about in the water for recreation and health. Fritz was among the first to leave the cars, and he stationed himself where he could watch the movements of the girl Madge. Some subtle instinct prompted him to do this, with the impression that she was what? That was an enigma. He could not for the life of him have told why but he was impressed with an idea that there was some strange romance connected with her visit to the seashore, that she did not come alone for pleasure, but for an object that might be worth investigating. She left the cars and at once took a carriage for the principal hotel. Not to be balked, Fritz jumped into another carriage and directed the driver to take him to the same hotel. His conveyance arrived first, and he was standing on the veranda when the carriage drove up with Madge and she got out. She scarcely noticed him as she came up the steps and passed into the hotel. But after she had registered, she came out and touched him on the arm. "'You are watching me? What for?' she asked, when he turned around facing her. "'Am I an object of suspicion to you, sir?' Fritz flushed uncomfortably and hardly knew how to answer. "'Well, I—I—' I... "'There, don't make any apologies or excuses. I know you are, and shall look out for you. 
Please understand, I am no criminal. She turned around again and swept haughtily into the hotel, while Fritz walked away toward the beach in meditation. She was sharper as lightning, he mused. Und dot makes me think some more dot, for some reason or other, she will bear watching. He took a bath in the ocean and then went back to the hotel. He was not quite satisfied to drop the matter where it was. Something urged him to pry further into the affairs of this young lady, whose case had struck him as being singular. Upon examining the register, he found that she was registered as Miss Madge Thurston, and assigned room 43. As nothing more offered, he sat down on the veranda, and watched the stream of people that surged in and out of the hotel and to and from the beach. Men, women, and children by the hundred, and yet there were scarcely two faces alike. During the afternoon, an elegant close carriage, drawn by a superbly harnessed pair of high-stepping bays, which were in turn driven by a liveried negro, came dashing down the avenue and drew up before the Brighton. A man of some thirty-five years of age leaped from the carriage and entered the hotel. A man with a sinister yet handsome face, ornamented with a sweeping mustache and a pair of sharp black eyes. He was attired in spotless white duck, with patent leather boots and a white plug hat and was evidently a person of some importance. He soon came out of the hotel, accompanied by the young woman Fritz had defended, and entering the carriage, they were whirled away down the avenue out of sight. Dot settles that. My game's gone, and I don't got some professional detective gaze there, Fritz growled as he watched the receding carriage. I'll bet a half a dollar I never see him again. But he was mistaken. That evening, when the moon was sending a flood of brilliant light down upon the long level beach, he was one of a thousand who took a stroll along the water's edge, over the damp sands of the sea. He was thus engaged, and watching the great luminous moon which seemed to have risen out of the distant watery waste, when a man touched him upon the shoulder. "'Excuse me,' he said respectfully, "'but are you Fritz, the young man who took a young lady's part on a ferryboat near Philadelphia today?' "'Well, I think I am, if I remember right. "'What of it?' Fritz replied. "'Well, sir, you are wanted to bear witness to a marriage ceremony tonight, up the coast, and I was sent for you. Step this way to the carriage, sir.' Scarcely knowing what was best to do, Fritz followed, got into an open carriage, and was driven rapidly north along the beach through the romantic moonshine. But how romantic was his little adventure destined to turn out? That was what he asked himself as he gazed doubtfully upon the greenish blue of Mother Ocean. End of chapter 1《Chapter 2 of Fritz to the Front by Edward L. Wheeler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. The Strange Marriage. In the course of a little over an hour, the carriage stopped at the inlet, where Fritz was told to get out and take a small boat and row across the water to the other shore, where he would find another carriage to complete his journey in. He accordingly did as directed, and had soon crossed the inlet, found the second carriage, and was once more rolling northward along the sandy beach. It seemed hours to him ere his conductor drew rein in front of a jutting bluff, which interrupted their further progress along the beach from the fact that it reached to the water's edge. For another hour he followed the driver, a grim, uncommunicative fisherman, on foot up a jagged path, which finally led into a lonely ocean cave, which the high tides of many centuries had washed out to about the size of an ordinary room. A torch thrust in a crevice in the rocky wall lit up the scene in a rather a ghostly way. About in the center of the cave stood three parties, Madge, a clerical-looking party, and another well-dressed man, with black hair and full beard. He stepped forward as Fritz and the fisherman entered the cave and said, "'Ah, I am glad you have come. I was fearing that you would not accommodate us, sir.' "'Well, I didn't vos know whether to come or not,' Fritz answered. "'But as I am here, what you want of me?' "'I will tell you. The young lady yonder and myself are about to be married, and to make things legal we prefer to have a couple of witnesses to the ceremony.' You will only be required to attach your signature to the married certificate, and will then be taken back to Atlantic City. Well, off dat is all, go ahead mit their business, Fritz said, perching himself on a rock. I don't know off it is a legal grass action or not, but I will do vot is right by der lady. 
then let's have the ceremony the prospective groom said are you ready madge quite ready the young lady replied smilingly then they clasped hands and the aged clerical looking gentleman read a marriage service asked the usual questions and pronounced them man and wife the parties to the consummation were announced as Miss Madge Thurston and Major Paul Atkins. At the conclusion of the ceremony, the clergyman filled out a certificate, signed it himself, and then requested Fritz to come forward and do likewise, and also the old fisherman. His request being obeyed, Major Atkins said, Your favor is duly appreciated, Mr. Snyder, and if an opportunity offers, I shall be happy to be of service to you. You may now return to town in the manner you came accordingly fritz did so not a little puzzled at his adventure and the strange wedding in the coast cave day was just beginning to lighten the eastern horizon when he arrived back at atlantic city and went to his room for a nap but he found that sleep would not come to his relief and so he was among the early fashionable bathers at the beach after a good refreshing bath he went back to the brighton and took a seat on the veranda he had not been seated long when a rapidly driven carriage whirled up before the hotel, and an elderly, portly man leaped out and hurried into the hotel, his face flushed with excitement. He was well dressed, wore a little bunch of gray side whiskers on either cheek, and was evidently all of sixty years of age. Fritz surveyed him closely with the short glimpse he got of him, and then scratched his head as if in quest of an idea. I'll bet half a dollar. I see in their whole business now, he muttered with a chuckle. It was plainer as mud to me. Dot couple what got married was elopers mit each other, und dis be der old man on der warpath after them, matter as a hornet. Der next thing is, who was der bully feller, vot ist honest und half der rocks to support dot virtue? After a few minutes, the old gentleman came out of the hotel and stood looking out upon the ocean, with rather a savage expression of countenance, and his was a face that could be very stern when occasion required it. "'I don't know whether I better poke my nose in their business or not,' Fritz muttered, taking a second survey of him. "'He looks as if he might swallow a feller if he got mad, and I don't vos care a pound imitatin' Jonah.' As if interpreting his thoughts, the old gent turned rather gruffly and took a searching glance at the young man. Well, he said, I suppose I look as if I wanted to cut someone's throat, don't I? Fritz laughed lightly. Well, I was thinking some things like that, he admitted. I thought so. I ain't a fool. I know when I am mad. I look mad. Do you know of any party around here who is particularly anxious to end his career and ain't got the grit to do the job? I would like to operate on such a chap. You feels like as if off you could pulverize someone, eh? Huh. I'll contract to lay out the first man that dirts look cross-eyed at me. I'm mad. I am mad as thunder. And I come from Leadville, too, where they raise thunder occasionally. Bah! I wish someone would step up and kick me. "'Well, I'm your man, if you really want a bona fide job done,' Fritz caused a pompous-looking man to say, who stood near, ventriloquially, of course. "'I'm the champion patent kicker from Kalamazoo.' The old gent from Leadville turned and gazed at the pompous-looking man a moment, his dander rising several degrees. "'Oh, so you're anxious to kick me, are you, my Christian friend? You want to kick me, do you?' he ejaculated. "'Who has said anything about kicking you, sir?' the pompous party demanded in haughty surprise. You'd evidently better go to bed and sleep off your cups, my friend. I haven't drank a drop, sir, in ten years, and for you to deny expressing a desire to boot me, sir. Why, man, I heard you. You are a liar, sir. I said nothing of the kind. Besides, I am not in the habit of picking quarrels with strangers. And with a shrug, the pompous man turned on his heel and walked off indignantly. Leadville's angered delegate gazed after him a moment with unutterable contempt, then turned to Fritz. Poor fool, he's no sand, or he'd not cut and run, after calling a man a liar. Up in Leadville, things are supremely different, but here, alas, is a lack of backbone. I say, young fellow, have you ever cherished dreams of becoming rich, a man of millions, as it were? Well, I don't know, but I have some of those anxiety to get rich vaunts in a vile, Fritz admitted. Well, sir, I can tell you just how you can do it the easiest, if you will stroll upon the beach with me. Accordingly, Fritz arose, and sauntered down to the beach with this eccentric Leadvillian, whoever he might prove to be. Now, suppose you'd like to know what I'm mad at, 
the old gent began, pushing his gold-leaded cane into the sand as they strolled along. Well, before I tell you, I want to know who you are and what your business is. My name was Fritz Snyder, and I was what you might call a detective, or dot is, I was trying my luck at their business. Indeed. Then perhaps it is well I have met you. For I have a case, and if you can win that case, you can also win five thousand dollars. How does that strike you? It hits me right where I live, when I is at home, Fritz grinned. Yost you give me their pints, and I'm your bologna. You can bet a half dollar on dot five thousand dollar job. What's their lay? Suicides, murder, stole some things, or run away mit another's wife's feller. Neither. A girl has run away from her home and is wanted. Five thousand dollars worth. She is my daughter, and is a somnambulist, and consequently of unsound mind at times. She frequently goes into a trance, and remains thus for weeks at a time, eating and drinking naturally enough, but knowing nothing what she has been doing when she awakens. Though to outward appearance she is awake when in this trance, but not in her right mind. I have consulted eminent physicians, but they pronounce her case incurable, and say she will some day die in one of these trances. Here the man from Leadville grew pathetic in his story, and wiped a tear from his eye, but finally went on. Well, as you may imagine, I have had a deal of trouble with her, for in her state of trance she has often robbed me of sums of money, and wandered off too sometimes. But this last blow has been the most severe, it came to my knowledge that she had become the prey of an unprincipled eastern rascal. He had met her during her somnambulistic wanderings, and prejudiced her against me, and caused her to rob not only me but others, and surrendered the stolen booty to him. On learning this, myself and neighbors formed into a vigilance committee to hunt the rascal down, but he took to his heels and fled eastward. A few days later my poor child turned up missing, and with her the sum of twenty thousand dollars, which had been paid me from the sale of a mine, and which I had lodged in my safe for safekeeping until I could deposit it the next day. Twenty thousand? So much as that? Yes, a big sum, and likewise nearly all the money I then possessed. I immediately took up the trail, but egad, t'was no use. The girl is sharper than lightning, and eluded me at every turn. I found that her destination was eastward, doubtless to join her evil genius. And so I telegraphed to Chicago and St. Louis for the detectives to look out and intercept her, if possible. But to no avail. She was seen in those places, but owing to some irregularity beyond my comprehension, was not captured. When I arrived in Chicago, I found that she had two days before left the city, eastward bound. I trailed her to Philadelphia, and there lost all track of her. Thinking quite likely she would come to this summer resort, I came on today in hopes of striking the trail, but all to no avail. I have as yet heard of no clue to her whereabouts. Well, das is pretty bad, Fritz assented. What is your name? My name is Thornton. I'm a mining speculator from Leadville, Colorado. Und your daughter's name was? Madge. She's a pretty young maiden, aged eighteen, and left her home very well dressed. Und der Weller, wat was pocketing der money? Wat was his name? It is hard to guess what his true name was. At Leadville he was called Pirate Johnson. At Pueblo he was known as Griffith Gregg. Gregg? Gregg? Fritz said meditatively. I am on the lookout for a man by that name, but my man is a smuggler. This villain may be connected with any nefarious piece of rascality. If only I had him here, one or the other of us would get laid out. That is as good as sworn to. God only knows what perils my poor child will pass through before I succeed in finding her, if I ever do. Well, I reckon we can find her, if there is such a thing in their dictionary, Fritz asserted. He then went on to relate the particulars of his assisting the lady on the boat, and of the marriage in the cave, which excited Mr. Thornton greatly. By heaven, I see through it all. Madge Thurston is no more or less than my daughter, and she has wedded this rascal Atkins, who is one and the same person who was the Greg or Johnson out west. God forbid that my child is married to such a wretch. Describe him. Fritz obeyed, giving a description according as he remembered the bridegroom, also of the man who took Madge Thurston from the hotel. 
The latter was undoubtedly Greg, the speculator declared. And the other also was, it is likely, disguised for the occasion with a false beard. Now, Fritz, I want you to help me find my child and break the neck of this rascal, and you shall have for reward the sum I promised you. We'll search this world high and dry, but what will recover my child? Come, let us seek a conveyance to take us to the cave. They accordingly went back to the Hotel Brighton, ate dinner, and afterward secured a carriage and set out for the scene of the strange wedding the night before. And thus Fritz entered into a $5,000 chase, which was destined to lead him into more adventures than he had yet experienced. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Fritz to the Front by Edward L. Wheeler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirk Ziegler The Bluff House In due time they arrived at the cave, where the ceremony of the previous night had taken place, but a thorough search of the cavernous washout failed to yield any tidings of the romantic lovers. Pshaw! There's no use of further search in this direction. They have long ere this set out for some other portion of the country and we are wasting time in tarrying here. Maybe dot is so, but I think they must go on up their coast instead of come back by Atlantic City. Not impossible. In that case, it will be our best lead to go back to Atlantic, take the cars to Philadelphia, and strike for some sea coast point ahead of them. That would be a pretty good idea for you, but I think I better remain on their coast, starting from here, and follow their trail in their rear. I'll bet a half a dollar I find him first, afore you do. Very well. It shall be as you deem best. I will leave you here and join you, or rather be there to meet you, when you reach Long Branch. If nothing results in our favor by that time, I'll decide what is the next best course to pursue. Here is a hundred dollars toward defraying your expenses. If you need more, telegraph to Jim Thornton at the Chalfont, Long Branch, and I'll remit and placing the sum of money in Fritz's possession, he soon after took his departure. After he had gone, Fritz sat down on a rock in the mouth of the cave, which overlooked the ocean, and gazed thoughtfully out upon the sunlit waters. Well, here I was, but their next question is, Where was I? he soliloquized. I have undertaken a job without any basis for their start off. I kinder wish Rebecca was here too, but as vision don't vas do some good, business is their next consideration. Night was not far distant, but he resolved to continue up the coast in hopes of finding a fisherman's house, where he could obtain food and lodging. He accordingly left the cave and continued his journey. He soon came to a level stretch of beach again, and followed its northward course for a number of miles. Until sunset, when he found himself as far from any human habitation as he had in the start. He accordingly sought a grassy spot back from the beach and lay down to rest. Arising early the next morning, he struck out once more on his journey, feeling decidedly anxious to find some kind of a human habitation, as he was very hungry. He soon spied a farmhouse, inland from the beach, and made for it in double-quick time. A gruff-looking man sat upon the front veranda, as he entered the well-kept yard, and eyed him with an expression of suspicion. "'Well, what do you want, young man?' he demanded sourly. "'Rub, some things to eat,' Fritz replied spiritedly. "'I was hungry as a sucker after a hard winter. "'Get out! I don't want no tramps about here. "'Clear, I say, or I'll set the dog on you,' the farmer growled, stamping on the veranda with his cane. "'But I don't vas no tramp, nor I don't vas scared of dead dogs,' Fritz replied. "'I want some breakfast, und ish able to pay for it like a gentleman. "'Go to a tavern, then. I don't keep no putting up place.' "'But I don't find some tavern, and I ain't going to go further until I get some dings to eat. "'So trot out their best what you have, and I pay you for them.' "'Didn't I tell you? You couldn't get something to eat here?' The man cried, getting exasperated, and then he began whistling for the dog. I'll show you who runs this place. All right. Fetch out their canine, 
Fritz grinned, perching himself on the fence and taking a pistol from his pocket. I used to leave half dog steak, ash beef stew, anything's to fill up when a veller was hungry. What? How dare you, sir? I'll have you arrested for carrying concealed weapons, you scamp. Then I have you arrested for causing cannibalism by not giving a feller some things to eat. Come now, mister, you set out their vittles, and there won't be no troubles. Otherwise, there may be an exposure of some things. The farmer stared at Fritz, unmeaning declaration, and giving him a swift, startled glance, rose and entered the house. Fritz noticed what effect his thoughtless shot had had, and gave vent to a low, peculiar whistle, denotive of surprise. Hello, what ish dose I've done? he mused. I give der old chap a sour grape dat time, all of which proves dat he is afraid of der exposure of some things, und don't vas got a clear conscience. Fell dot is pretty good, too. One thing leads to another. Maybe I will discover some things else. Anyhow, I'm going to stay right here until I get some things to eat, und I reckon der old man will fetch or send it. Nor was he wrong in his reckoning, for shortly afterward a plump and pretty maid brought him out a tray of victuals that looked almost tempting. There was bread and butter, cold meat, cake, pie, apples, and a bowl of rich milk. No wonder Fritz's eyes sparkled with satisfaction as he sat down upon the carriage block and received the offering. "'I thank you more as a thousand times,' he said. "'Der old man didn't vas going to give me some things.' but I told him I would expose him, and dot fixed him. What's der old crab's name, young lady? The girl stared. Mr. Sample, do you mean? She asked in surprise. Yes, I reckon dot is der one. Der old vinegar barrel, vot just zot there on der veranda. So his name was Sample, eh? If he was a sample of der neighbors around here, I dinks I stopped no more. He vas got a secret, don't he? How should I know, sir? Oh, well, I didn't know but what you might have heard some things. If I had, I don't believe I should confess it to you, the maid retorted. When you get through eating, leave the server on the block. But, hold on, you ain't going. Yes, but wait a while. I say no, I want to ask you some questions. What? Well, one thing, is there a town some better near, on their coast? Yes, several. What one is their nearest? Forsyth Landing. What is their population? Four people. Chimney Dunder. So much as dot? Any old maids among their lot? Nary a maid. Well, dot's all. Much obliged. After she had departed, Fritz finished his meal and then resumed his tramp along the lonely beach. Half an hour brought him to the landing, but he did not pause. Two rough-looking old sea-dogs were lounging outside a sort of a hut, but their appearance did not inspire Fritz with any desire to cultivate their acquaintance. About sunset he arrived at a far prettier spot than he had yet encountered. A great bluff of land rolled up to an abrupt and precipitous ending at the ocean's edge. In high tide it would be impossible to walk along the beach at the base of the bluff, owing to the depth of the water, while at low tide the beach was quite bare. The evening tide was rolling in close to the base of the cliff when Fritz reached it, and so he paused and took a reconnaissance. Far up on the top of the bluff he saw a large, rambling old house in a grove of trees, but whether it was deserted or not he could not tell. It looked so grim in the weird sunset light and so isolated in its lone watch by the sea that one might easily have fancied it an abode of spooks and their like. I expect that I'll have to climb up and go around that bluff, Fritz muttered, not at all liking the idea. If a feller was to try unt wade along der front, he'd like us not get round, and dot would be a doyful of a fix. I wonder if der folks who live up yonder are samples of dot sample I met this morning. Looks like as if it might be a ghost factory. He was considering what was best to do when he felt a tap on his shoulder and wheeled around about with a nervous start. Before him stood a ragged, frowsy-haired, barefooted girl, some sixteen or seventeen years of age. A girl with a well-rounded figure but of medium stature, 
and a face at once peculiar and attractive from the sparkle of its eyes the broad grin of its mouth and the amount of dirt gathered about it she had evidently but recently emerged from the water for her long black hair as well as her wet garments were dripping with drops which the drying sunlight transformed into diamonds ha ha she laughed putting her pretty arms akimbo and staring hard at fritz don't i look silly though well i don't know about dot i think der obligation of some water mit your face would make you look better as what you are now fritz answered somewhat puzzled water ha ha i just came out of the water but oh i'm so silly that's what everybody says and i guess it must be so anyhow they call me silly sue was you ever silly boss well i don't vas not so much about dot whether i vas or not fritz replied with a doubtful grin do i look silly oh lordy you are the silliest looking goose i ever saw i never saw a yankee but what he was silly but i don't vas be a yankee get out don't dispute me i know just who and what you are you are neptune come up from the bottom of the sea you lie like dunder fritz retorted back backing up and beginning to get considerably alarmed for he began to suspect that she was crazy i was no neptune at all no one but fritz schneider it's a wonder you don't call me joner but swallowed the whalebone nope you're neptune do you see the house up yonder well yes what of it oh that's the high old roost ghosts and skeletons perch up there after dark and grin and rattle their bones at you they don't do it to me because i feed em stuff ha <laughs> ha can you snuff the silly part of that outrageous gag say boss where are you going if it ain't askin too much well i don't know dot myself don't know where you're going no i was hunting for somebody oh so am i i was hunting for someone when i discovered something and they called me silly because i refused to tell what well good day swim over to england when you want to see me again then with a peal of elfish laughter she ran and sprung into the water and swam around the base of the cliff out of sight i'll pet a half a dollar dot gal was half drunk or crazy one or der other und der best thing for me to do is slip away while i can fritz ejaculated to think was to act with him and he accordingly set out clambering up the steep side of the bluff in due time he reached the top and found a level spot of a couple of acres extent in the center of which the house was situated surrounded by sentinel rows of sighing hemlocks a general aspect of desolation was perceptible on every hand showing the premises to be untenanted the garden was grown up with rank weeds and the house weather-worn and old some of the shutters hanging by one hinge it was a large structure with many queer gables wings and projections and fronted upon a road which had been used to communicate with some thoroughfare further inland dot looks as if it was going to rain fritz muttered gazing at an ominous bank of clouds that was gathering in the west i think maybe i'd better stay in der old house till morning if i and der ghosts can agree i don't vas much afraid of ghosts anyhow and he evidently was not for he boldly entered the house by the creaking front door and closed the door behind him when the clouds had overspread the sky in an inky mass and darkness had set in around the gloomy edifice two black-whiskered men came along and stopped at the mansion end of chapter three chapter four of fritz to the front by edward l wheeler this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kirk ziegler the ghastly relic meantime fritz had been in the old rookery some time prior to the arrival of the bearded men no sooner had he entered the large hall and closed the door behind him than he felt a sort of dread of something he knew not what there was a damp musty deathly smell about the place that he did not quite like i don't know whether i was afraid of ghosts or not he soliloquized pausing and gazing around him it looks as if this might be a place better they manufacture ghost shows but somebody has lifted here once upon a time 
the carpet yet remained upon the floor of the long hall and also upon the staircase which led to the upper floor there was also a large picture hung up on the wall passing along the hall fritz tried each of the doors which opened off from it but in each instant he found them locked and was unable to effect an entrance well dot looks like as if nobody was to home he muttered i'll try der upstairs part und if i don't have no better success i will stay out mid der hall he accordingly ascended the hall staircase and proceeded to take a tour of the upper part of the rambling old structure here the doors were all locked with one exception and this had evidently been left as locked the bolt being turned but the door not having been tightly closed the bolt failed to enter the socket opening this door fritz entered and found himself in a large furnished apartment there being a carpet old and moth-eaten upon the floor several pieces of stuffed furniture which had also been victims of moth and worm and a large round oaken table in the centre of the room and over this suspended by a cord which was fastened to the ceiling was an object which caused fritz to utter a grunt of startled alarm it was a man's head cut from the body at the throat and held in suspension by a cord fastened to the long hair the head had probably hung there for a year or so for the flesh had dried down upon the bones the eyes however retained their glassy stare the teeth showed to ghastly advantage and the heavy black moustache and goatee bristled ferociously fritz gave a startled cry and his hair fairly raised on end as he beheld the strange spectacle but the longer he stared at it the less his alarm and finally advanced into the room by shiminy i was scared like ash der doyful at first but now i don't vos a bit afraid somebody hanged out up there just for a scarecrow if der ghost vos to see it i'll bet half a dollar dey would run just then there was a flash of lightning and a heavy roll of thunder which caused fritz to start and give a nervous glance at the swinging head i don't quite vos like it here he muttered uneasily it makes a feller think he's going to get smashed up every minute i wonder what they keep up there and his eyes rested upon an aperture in the ceiling such as is often provided in houses as a means of reaching the roof a stout rope hung down through this opening to the floor of the room and had evidently been used to climb up into the attic fritz was just contemplating it when a sound of footsteps in the hall outside aroused him to quicker thoughts i'll bet a half a dollar it's a ghost coming he gasped the tendency of his hair being again decidedly upward but it was a cold day when they scald me mit their tommyhawk as long as i can climb accordingly up the rope he went hand over hand with the agility of a monkey and soon gained the attic immediately above the chamber it was a dark ill-smelling place and so far as fritz could see used for no particular purpose whatever ensconcing himself directly beside the aperture through which he had come up fritz prepared to await developments he was not a little anxious to know who the newcomer was whether a human or spiritual being for if the latter he had a curiosity to inspect it in a few moments the door opened and a strapping irishman stalked into the chamber a lank lean specimen of humanity with a kilkenny face red hair a fringe of reddish beard under his lower jaw extending to his ears and attired in brogans short pantaloons and a blue soldier coat with grimy clay pipe in his mouth and battered plug hat on his head of the rail old race of irishmen he certainly was a good specimen Arr, sure it's devil one room but they have locked and a sorry place it is too for a decent irish gentleman and the son of a duke at that bad cess to sich a country anyhow it's work like the devil for a bit of grub and when a man gets out of work sure stomach has to pay for it if he is ask a man will he be after givin yes a nip of bread he'll tell yes or off wid ye ye murderin tromp or i'll sick that pur upon yes bedad i'll yous pet half a dollar der irishman vos pin stoppin mit staples fritz muttered with a grin taking a peep at the son of erin he vos hungry like vot i vos wonder off he haf discovered their skeleton yet avail the hibernian had not evidently for he was perched composedly beneath the suspended head 
"'Sorry place this is for the son of a duke,' he went on muttering. "'Sure it looks as if the old devil himself had been here. "'Guess this property would be selling mighty cheap that while.' Ugh. "'As a heavy clap of thunder caused the house to shake from stem to stern. "'A sorry wild night it's going to be, "'and it's meself that's wishing I was back "'for it's the further side of the big puddle.' "'Ha! Ha!' laughed Fritz, throwing his voice to the farther side of the room. "'Yes, ha! Bad cess to the likes of yes, whoever ye may be!' the Irishman cried, fiercely, gazing in vain around the apartment in search of the author of the laugh. "'Ho, ho! Itchy, dirty Irish!' Fritz caused a different voice to say, in a still opposite part of the room. "'No, I'm devil a one of the likes!' the son of Aaron cried, getting angry. "'Bad luck to yees! If ye gets me hands on yees, it's a devil's own trouncin' you'll get entirely. "'I'll have yees know my name is Patrick Grogan, and it's the dassin, gentlemanly son of a duke, and a duchess I am, bedad. "'A son of a gun, more likely. Look out, you bloody Irish, or I will spit on you!' Fritz caused the suspended head to say, in a hoarse, gurgling voice. "'Aha! It's spittin' on me! Yees'll be, eh?' the Hibernian cried, leaping from his seat, his walking-stick in hand, a formidable piece of real thorn. "'Oh, you black-livered omadden, if I catch yez, won't I touch yez to be decent and civil to a gentleman?' Then, chancing to glance upward, he saw for the first the swinging head, and in utter horror dropped upon his knees and raised his hands upward in supplication. "'Oh, holy Virgin Mary, protect me!' he howled, his terrified gaze glued upon the unsightly object. "'Oh, murder and Maria! Osh, bad luck, for I have done, Mr. Devil! Sure it's nary a thing wrong I've did, nor shall then I never been guilty of!' "'You vas son of a seacock!' came from the head. "'Yes, oh, sure, as anything is wants, Mr. Devil, only don't be after hurtin' the likes of me! Then arise, dirty Irish!' and climb into the attic before the spirits come to wrap their icy clutches around you. Sure, I'll be after going, Pat cried, and he did go, not up the rope, but out of the room as fast as he could go. Nor did he pause until outside of the house, as Fritz could tell by the sound of his rapidly retreating footsteps. Well, dot was pretty good fun, Fritz muttered with a grin. I dink I will wait till someone else comes. He had not long to wait before footsteps sounded once more, coming up the stairs, just as the storm broke loose outside and torrents of rain poured down upon the roof while the thunder rumbled ominously. Presently two men entered, one carrying a lantern, for it was now quite dark. Both were roughly dressed and brutal-looking fellows, wearing heavy black beards. Hmm, was Fritz's mental comment as he beheld them. I'll bet a half a dollar I smells von mice. If I have not made a big mistake, I dinks I have stumbled right in their smuggler's den what I am looking for. It was only a sudden suspicion, to be sure. Nevertheless, it struck him very forcibly. One of the men set the lantern upon the table, and then perched himself beside it, while the other sat down upon a chair and gazed speculatively at the ghastly object which hung suspended from the ceiling. "'I wonder how long afore the rest of their boys will be here,' he growled. "'Don't know,' the other fellow replied. "'Hope they'll come afore long and settle the matter, so that we'll know what we've got to do.' "'How do you think it's going?' "'Don't know. Reckon the majority will be again for the poor cuss.' "'I'm thinking that way, too. I kinder hope not, though, for I don't fancy the job.' "'Shh! You're chicken-hearted without cause. He has never made love to you.' "'Darn it, no, but he's too fine a specimen of manhood to feed to the sharks. Phew, many's the one better, and he what's enriched the bottom of the sea. I wonder who the Irishman was. We met him at the front. Some tramp, I'll allow, who'd sought a night's shelter here, and got skeered at our friend Bill.' And he glanced at the swinging head with a laugh. "'Hello, I say, Bill. How are you getting along in your new place of residence?' First rate, apparently answered the grinning head followed by a ghostly sort of gurgling laugh. "'Gee, Hosaphat!' cried the questioner, leaping to his feet. "'Thunder and lightning! Did you hear that hand?' "'Well, I should murmur,' Hank grunted, leaving the table with a spring and landing near the door. "'What the devil's the matter?' 
"'Cuss it if the cadaveral Bill Budge didn't speak,' the first man cried. "'Get out. Budge had been dead over a year. How in thunder could he speak? Maybe a spirit he's come back into his head.' "'Phew! Impossible! It was our fancy. We didn't hear nothing,' Hank growled, edging a little nearer to the door. "'You're a liar!' thundered the voice, seeming to come directly from between the pearly teeth of the suspended head, and to make matters worse, the head began to swing slowly to and fro. With howls and curses, the two masked men made the hastiest kind of exit from the room and down the stairs, while Fritz in the attic was convulsed with laughter. "'That was better than half a dozen suppers, pie chimney,' he snorted, holding his sides." All was quiet now for some time, except for the howling of the storm without. But finally, footsteps were again heard, and eight men, all masked but one, filed into the room. The eighth man was a young man, of prepossessing appearance, unmasked, and had his hands bound behind his back. He was better dressed than his grim captors, and there was a fearless, cool expression upon his face that at once won Fritz's admiration. Ha! Ah, Hank and Jim have been here already and gone, a tall, broad-shouldered member of the party said. They'll be back directly, no doubt. And now, Hal Hartley, we will proceed to review your case and dispose of it according to the decision of the majority. Go ahead, Captain, the prisoner replied calmly. I am as well prepared now as I shall be. End of chapter 4《ハッピーバースデーとは、Front by Edward L. Wheeler。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirk Ziegler。Bill Budge's Conversation。To Fritz, the scene below, of course, began to grow more interesting. Dot Veller was going to be tried for some things, he muttered. Und what is more, of der verdict don't vas in his favor. He vas going to get spilled. Young Hartley, if his thoughts were in the same channel as those of the watcher, didn't appear very much troubled by the matter, for he perched himself upon the table, while the six jurors sat in a semicircle facing him, and the captain a little to one side. "'Well, sir, what do you have to say, Hartley, in regard to this suspicion which has arisen against you, that you are a traitor to our cause?' "'Nothing, sir, except that whoever started the suspicion is a liar and a coward,' was the retort. "'Then you deny that you have ever betrayed the existence of this band outside of its own membership?' "'I do, most emphatically. What assurance have you that any one has betrayed you?' "'Is it not ample proof when strange men haunt this vicinity and haunt the members to their very doors? These law sharks or detectives only wait for some disclosure to spring their traps on me and my faithful followers. I am not to blame. Though forced into service against my will,' and made to swear the oath of allegiance rather than lose my life i have kept such secrets as came into my possession i believe i know who has excited the suspicious feeling against me well sir who your rascally son for one your jealous daughter for another hartley replied shrugging his shoulders with a contemptuous laugh how dare you term my son rascally sir and accuse my child of jealousy because the boy is as unprincipled a villain as yourself, and as for your daughter, when she found that I did not court her favor, she at once turned against me. I despise both your son and your daughter, Captain Gregg, and that is all I have to say, except that I am not guilty of the charge preferred against me. That remains to be told by the jury. You see the head of Bill Budge? Just above you, Hartley? He was caught in an intended act of treachery, and you see his end. If Bill could speak, he'd tell you that the fate of the traitor is hard. You're a cussed liar, Budge's suspended remnant seemed to say in a deep, hoarse voice. The captain and the jury uttered each a startled oath and gazed at the offending head in astonishment. Who called me a liar? Greg demanded fiercely. By the gods! I thought it was Budge's lips that uttered those words. So it was, the head seemed to say. Then there was a gurgling sort of laugh, and the head shook perceptibly. Ten thousand furies, Greg yelled, and hastily wrenching open the door, he made a hasty exit from the room, followed by the jurors. 
nor did they stop short of the bottom of the stairs. Hartley did not leave the room, but dismounting from his perch upon the table, walked off a few paces to where he could get a good look at Budge's unfortunate pate. "'Something deuced funny here. I'm blowed if there ain't,' he soliloquized, apparently quite composed. "'It is the first time I've ever heard dead men talk. I say, Budge, how's the temperature up your way?' Two thousand degrees above blood heat,' seemed to issue from between the gleaming teeth. Hmm, pretty warm, that I must admit, Hartley said, still looking more puzzled. Fritz, while perpetuating the ventriloquism, was also listening and planning. What der feller Hartley is der very chap to help me out mit my scheme, he muttered. Und we must escape from here before der smugglers return. Accordingly, he slid down the rope into the room below. Hartley looked surprised. Who the deuce are you? he demanded, stepping back a pace. "'Fritz Snyder, detective,' Fritz replied. "'I come here on business. "'What for, you can easily guess. "'I want you to help me out mit it, "'und I will see dat you half your liberty. "'Ha! <laughs> that's your game, is it? "'Well, my friend, I'd like to do it, first rate, "'but I cannot oblige you. "'Why not? "'Because I swore allegiance to the cause you would have me betray, "'and never shall be said that Hal Hartley was not a man of his word. "'But I heard you say dot vos forced in der business. "'So I was against my will. "'But that does not lessen the obligations of my oath. "'While I live I shall adhere to my sworn promise. "'You vas foolish. "'You don't will get any credit for your resolve.' Just as like as not you will be killed on their suspicion dot's already against you. Perhaps. If so, I shall submit, knowing I have been innocent of breaking my word. Pshh! This was all nonsense. You don't vas want to die no more as any other man. Let me cut their bonds what fastens your arm, und we will climb up to der attic und escape from der roof to some place where we will be safe, until we can make arrangements to break up this smuggler's league. Nothing would please me more, but owing to my oath, I must positively refuse to do anything of the kind, Hartley persisted firmly. I admire your proposed attempt, and while I shall do nothing to interrupt it, I cannot consciously do anything to help it along. Can you enlighten me any as to the mystery of this head, which, though not possessed of life, yet uses its voice so naturally? I tell you nothing's about it, Fritz replied, shaking his head. Hark! Yes, I hear it. It is Greg and the boys coming back. Quick, or you will be seen. Fritz made haste to shin up the rope to the garret once more, and had barely succeeded in doing so when the smugglers, headed by Captain Greg, once more entered the room. They did not come boldly in, but thrust their heads in and looked around at first. Seeing that no harm had come to Hartley, they then ventured in. "'Ah, you're brave fellows, ain't you?' he laughed. "'I didn't cut tail and run, although I have not even the use of my hands.' "'You're cursed brave all at once,' Greg growled, evidently not liking the taunt. "'Did that thing speak again?' with a wry glance at the guiltless pate of the departed budge. "'Of course, I've had quite a chat with William,' Hartley replied. "'He says he's in a very warm latitude at present, "'and so he's come back spiritually for a short cooling off.' "'Greg uttered an oath. Huh, I don't believe such posh.' "'But it's a fact, nevertheless. "'Budge says they've got a little corner left up in this country, "'for you too, when you get ready to emigrate, "'which will be mighty soon, "'judging by the active preparations that are being made to receive you.' such as gathering kindling wood, making matches, and the like. "'Curse you! They'll get you first. the smuggler said with vicious emphasis. "'Go ahead, boys, and tell them the decision you've made.' "'Well, we've concluded that Hal Hartley is a traitor to our cause, and for the sake of protection it will be necessary to feed him to the fishes,' one of the jurors said. "'Hey, ain't that the ticket, boys?' A grunt of assent from the others was the answer. "'Then it shall be so.' Captain Gregg ordered. I'm sorry for you, Hartley, but treachery merits death, as you were informed when you joined. As an organization which must exist in secrecy, we are forced to adopt harsh rules. Your companions have carefully weighed all the evidence, and have decided that the safety of the organization demands your death. As you have sown, 
so shall you reap. Do you mean this, Captain Gregg? I do, sir, emphatically. Then you shall live to repent ever having pronounced my doom. Henceforth I shall not consider my oath of allegiance obligatory, as I have hitherto done. I'll show you what harm I can do your vile organization. But you shall have no chance. Jim Hovell and his brother have already consented to sink you to the bottom of the Atlantic for a stated sum, and thus rid us of you effectually. They are waiting below for you, as it is a safe night for such work. If you have any prayers to make, you had better make the best use of your time. I'll suit myself about that, you villain. Numbers two and three, take the prisoner downstairs, the captain ordered. Two of the smugglers seized hold of poor Hartley and led him from the room. Up in the attic, Fritz was in a predicament. The majority of the smugglers yet remained in the room below, and he could not get out of the house in that way, as was his desire, to make an attempt, if possible, to rescue Hal Hartley. The only course left for him was to escape through a trap-door onto the roof, and trust in luck in getting to the ground from there. "'Dot Veller vos von big fool for not accepting my advice,' he mused, as he fumbled cautiously around in the darkness. Just like as not, they will be gone off mid him when I get down there, and den he fill be a conner, sure as their dickens. It required several minutes to find the trap in the roof, and it was no slight job to displace it. When he had accomplished this much, however, it was but a moment's work to clamber out upon the roof in the pouring rain and replace the door. Pie chimney, dot was a hard storm, he soliloquized. Der ocean grunts as if she fust got dis pepersy. Now der next thing is something else. Der roof was slippery as von soap ladle, and first I'd know der will be a dead Dutchman spilled some fetters over de ground. That portion of the main roof of the building was quite steep, and the eaves were at least twenty-five feet from the ground. Not fancying the idea of a drop of that distance, the young detective crawled into the ridge to reconnoiter. On the other side of the ridge, the roof sloped down to meet a gable, from where the gable's roof took another descent, so as to bring the eaves about seven feet nearer to the ground. Aside from this, there was no possible way of reaching terra firma. Eighteen feet! I don't know Veta I can stand out or no. I must try, however. Or Hal Hartley was a dead codfish, sure. Using extreme caution, he slid from one ridge to the other, and then from that to the eaves, from where he was to drop. Well, here's their place, where I don't was so much tickled, but business was business, und a feller don't was can't rise in their world without dropping sometimes. So, here goes, he muttered, and clinging to the eaves for a second, he let himself go. Down, down he went, with great velocity and finally struck upon something softer than Mother Earth, from which he tumbled end over end to the ground. The following instant a wild, unearthly howl rent the night. Ah! Uh, murder! Murder! shrieked a man's voice. I'm kilt! I'm kilt! Och, boy, Merchant Mary, save me! It was the Irishman's voice. It was upon him that Fritz had first alighted, and he was probably badly jarred up for he continued to hop around and yell at the top of his voice. To make matters worse, the door of the house opened, and Greg and his followers came pouring out. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Fritz to the Front » by Edward L. Wheeler This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirk Ziegler on the scent. Fritz had been stunned a little. Even after tumbling off from the yelping Irishman, still he had sense enough to struggle to his feet on seeing the smugglers rush from the building. Shut hope, he cried, addressing Grogan. The smugglers are upon us. Draw your weapons, if you have any, and fire. Don the weapons, Grogan growled, refusing to hear reason. Ah, holy virgin! It's kilt, sure I am, entirely. Hello! "'What the devil is the matter here?' the captain shouted, waving his lantern on high. "'Who is it that's making all this noise?' "'Spies! Detectives!' suggested one of his companions. "'Shoot him down!' "'Hurrah! Death to the spy!' cried a third. 
and then they made a rush forward and seized upon Pat, despite his lively use of his bit of buckthorn on the defensive. Perceiving that he was not seen, Fritz crawled softly away to a safe distance and then paused to look back. The yelling had ceased in the vicinity of the house, and the lantern light had disappeared from view, leaving naught but blank darkness and the pouring rain, which came down monotonously but heavily. "'I'll bet half a dollar that they've choked their life out off der duke son of a gun,' Fritz muttered, creeping under the cover of a dense tree. "'I wonder off I broke any of his horns when I lit on him. By shiminy, he must have a constitution like a mule, or it has smashed him all to sausage meat.' Evidently something was to pay, for except the sound of the storm and the dashing of the ocean against the bluff, all was quiet.' The smugglers had either killed Grogan on the spot or taken him back into the house with them. And poor Hartley, what had become of him? That was the question which troubled Fritz far more than the fate of the lean man from Kilkenny. He fuss gone up goose anyhow, and I don't suppose it will do some great deal off good to worry about him. Only I wish I could have saved him, he mused. It was a wild night at the best and Fritz heartily wished that he was back in Philadelphia, sitting in the old pawnbroker's shop beside his girl, Rebecca. Still, he would not willingly have given up what he had learned in reference to the Smugglers' League for a good deal, and he was resolved to hang to the matter attentively until he should be able to trip and trap the rogues and break up their existence as an organization. Knowing of no other available shelter in the vicinity, he resolved to linger under the tree until the smuggler should leave the building, when he would once more take possession. The night was well advanced, however, when he heard them leave in a body and start off down the lonely road. On first thought, he was tempted to follow them, but a cold blast of wind from off the ocean warned him that he was wet to the skin, and the best thing he could do would be to get under roof and dry off. He accordingly went back into the deserted house and sat down in the lower hall. Though not cowardly, he had no desire to keep further company with the grinning skull of the late lamented Budge, whoever he may have been. Rolling up one end of the old carpet, he converted it into a sort of pillow and lay down out of the draft. Sleep soon came to his relief, and he slept soundly until morning, when he was awakened by the sun shining in his face through a rear hall window. Rising, he went out of doors to reconnoiter and consider what was best to do next. It was a clear, glorious morning after the storm. The sun shone brightly, and a soft salt breeze blew off from the ocean, which was at once refreshing and invigorating. But it was not this sort of refreshment that Fritz now yearned for. He had had nothing to eat since the previous morning and was decidedly hungry and faint. Those fellers don't vas can live good days from here, what I saw last night, he mused. But ten to one, if I ask them for some things to eat, they bounce me out. He advanced to the northern edge of the bluff and took a look in that direction. To his surprise he saw, not more than half a mile away, a little village nestling near the beach. This village, for charity's sake, we will call Milburg, as that name will answer quite as well as any other. There might have been a hundred buildings, all told, and it was evidently a fishing hamlet, as a number of small boats and smacks were drawn up along the beach. Just outside the breakers, an ocean steamship of small size and trim build was anchored. Upon her sides was painted in large letters the word Countess. I don't know whether I go down there or not, Fritz muttered, gazing down upon the village. I don't vas no neater which job I better look to first. Their smuggler business or their girl business? For their latter, I have their promise of five thousand dollars. For their former, I like as not get paid off mit a broken head. Still, I don't want to leave this place until I trip and trap their game and turn it over to their law. For this is their whole game, sure. After some deliberation, he decided to go down to the village. The people would not offer him any molestation probably, unless he gave them cause to suspect him, and he resolved to be constantly upon his guard. Descending from the bluff, he walked along the beach, and finally entered the little burg. It was rather a rough-looking place, built up of weather-worn wooden shanties, a few stores, and a sort of tavern. 
There were, however, two imposing residences on opposite sides of the only street, which were built of stone and set down in large shaded lawns. Passing up the street, Fritz was the target for many curious glances of rough-looking men who sat in their doorways, but paying no attention to them, he entered the tavern and purchased his breakfast, to which he was able to do full justice. Afterward, he came out in the bar room and sat down. A half a dozen rough-looking fellows were lounging about, who, to judge from their looks, were in the habit of engulfing more grog than was good for them. Then the landlord, who kept close watch over them, was the fattest specimen of manhood Fritz had seen. His girth was enormous. He was not a villainous-looking man, like the rest, and this fact impressed Fritz more favorably than anything else he saw about the premises. During the forenoon, a well-dressed, fine-looking man, with iron-gray hair and mustache, galloped up to the tavern on horseback. He looked as if he had been reared in luxury, for there was that haughtiness of mine that betokened the arrogant aristocrat. "'Good morning, John,' he said, as the tavern-keeper waddled to the door. "'Will you send up a basket of champagne during the day and a barrel of good ale? The champy for her ladyship, the countess, you know, and the ale for the villagers. Going to have a sort of jollification at the lawn tonight, you know, in honor of the arrival of the countess, and want you all to turn out.' Then he galloped on, quite as airily as he had come. "'Who vos that big feelin' rooster?' Fritz asked when John re-entered the tavern. "'That? Why, that's Honorable Granby Greyville,' the fat man replied. "'The rich aristocrat who owns most of the land hereabouts. A right big feeling man, too, as you say.' "'Granby Grenville, eh?' Fritz commented under his breath. "'Vell, dot ish funny.' I thought sure dat was Captain Gregg, der smuggler, und I don't vas so much foolish apout it yet. I pet a half a dollar. I find out some things before I leave der place. Resolved to remain a few days in the village for the purpose of prospecting, Fritz made himself at home about the hotel. One suspicion after another was gradually occurring to him, and he was not slow to give them a thorough consideration prior to putting them to test. Of all things, he was desirous of attending the jollification, as the horseman had termed it, with a view of seeing the countess, who he learned had lately arrived from England, in her own steamship, for a few weeks' stay upon the Atlantic coast and a visit to her prospective husband, Greyville. During the afternoon, a man entered the tavern, who evidently had blood in his eye. His whole appearance seemed to indicate that he was anxious to have a fight with someone and was not particular who it was. He was a large, raw-boned fellow, with great muscular development. His face was large, with a bristling stubble of black beard upon the lower portion. His eyes were dark and wild, his hair silvered with broad streaks of white, and worn in shaggy, unkempt mass. His mouth was large, and his teeth projected beyond his lips in a horrible manner. His attire, too, was ragged and greasy, with clumsy, stogy boots upon his feet and a dilapidated hat upon his head. On entering the room, he paused and glared around him, as if in search of someone on whom to vent his wrath. "'Well, Bully Jake, what'll you have?' the tavern-keeper demanded with a frown, for the ruffian was evidently an unwelcome intruder. "'Well, I don't care if I do take a drap o' liquor,' the man growled, glaring around. "'You two blazes, I mean, what do you want here?' Fat John grunted. "'A furriner, a furriner. "'You know I'm death on em, and there can't none of them can stay around here while I have things my way. "'What foreigner is there now?' "'A Dutch cuss, blast his eyes, there he sets. "'He indicated Fritz, who was tipped back in one corner. "'Oh, but I'll go through him. "'I'll pulverize and sow him to the seven winds of the earth.' Then, with a tragic stride, he made for Fritz, pausing but a few paces away from him and shaking his fist fairly in his face. "'You, look!' the ruffian cried. "'Do you know who I am?' "'Well, I dinks I don't vas half made your acquaintance,' Fritz replied, retaining his seat, but on guard for an attack, if one was made. "'Ha, oh, ha, oh, I reckon not, and you will wish you never had, afore I get through with you,' Bully Jake declared." Beholding me, my furrin rooster, Jake Jagog, commonly known as Bully Jake, the terror of the coast. I'm a cyclone, I am. Then I'm prime minister to his honor, 
Granby Greville, and from him I have orders to demolish every Turin craft what sought anchor in his domains. Therefore, if you want her escape, he total annihilation, I'd advise you to get. If ye ain't seen going in less than two seconds, I'll stamp ye out of existence. Well, when I gets ready to go, then I will go, but not before, Fritz retorted. If you makes me any troubles, I plack your eye for you. Oh, ye will, eh? Oh, snortin' walrus and white-haired whales, roared the bully, and sprung savagely upon the young detective, as if bent on his certain destruction. Fritz clinched with him. It was to be a struggle of brute strength now. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Fritz to the Front by Edward L. Wheeler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. The Struggle. Both were strong, active men, Fritz in particular being well supplied with all the necessary muscle and agility of the prize fighter, although he by no means looked as if he was an ugly customer to handle. After clinching, the two men soon tripped and fell to the floor, where the struggle literally began in all its meaning. "'Oh, I'll show ye how they're howlin' porpoise fights,' Bully Jake roared, endeavoring to get a bite at Fritz's nose. "'I'll chaw ye up like a dish of hash.' "'Will you do?' Fritz cried, finally getting his hands free and clinching them around the bully's throat tightly. "'I'll bet you to half a dollar you won't do nothing's done with your kind.' and now getting the ruffian under him he gradually shut off his wind hold on hold on no choking no choking i say and again their moral rules of fighting i don't vas see it that way fritz said either you vas got to ax my parting for assaulting me or i will choke off your breath so you will have none to use no choke i say let me up and i'll fight you according to the book not let up was the young detective's reply when you come fooling around mit der Dutchman, you bet your life you get left. Apologize, I tells you, or I turns the throttle und shuts off der steam off your locomotive. I mean business. No apology, no breath. Vos you understand? The man began to wince as Fritz closed his terrible grip. Oh, let me up, and we'll call it square, the man gurgled. When you tells me I asked your humble parting, then I let you up. But I won't. Then I will squeeze your windpipe, so. I ask your pardon. Oh, yes, I do. Thar, now let me up. Fritz obeyed and let the ruffian rise from the floor, but just as soon as he was on his feet, Bully Jake drew a long knife. Oh, I didn't say what I do next, he howled, brandishing the blade threateningly. I'll cut your cussed heart out now. Will you, do? Well, I'll bet you yost a half a dollar on dat I will, Fritz cried, drawing and cocking his revolver. Now, if you come on, if you want to get their whole top of your head plowed off, I can do their job with greatest of pleasure. The sight of the revolver caused the big loafer to pause. You wouldn't shoot when I'm only in fun, would you? He asked incredulously. Well, just try me and see, that's all, was the retort. Your funny vas was entirely too thin, my friend. I don't vas like it, so I will give you one minute to get out. If you don't vas gone by dot time, I will shoot you quicker as I would fun little cat. Van got ready. All der while. Zwei. High time you vas getting out. Tree. When I hollers dot, if you don't vas gone, I spot you. Then tearfully and sadly, I must tear myself away from you, the ruffian declared with a grimace as he stalked toward the door. I'll allow ye hold on their grip now, but that ain't saying you'll always hold it. Then he took his leave. Fritz was not sorry. He did not want to hurt anyone unless forced to, and yet was bound to defend himself. Toward evening, the loungers, one by one, quitted the tavern until Fritz and Fat John were the only ones in the barroom. Then it was that the latter spoke. I say, young feller, he said, you're a extraordinary chap, and if it wouldn't be haskin' too much, I'd like to inquire what brings you here. Well, business, I thinks. Fritz replied, "'When judging by their latest demonstrations, I will have lots of it. You had better look out sharp for number one, I tell you, for though this ain't counted no hard town, they generally pitch into a stranger and try to bulldoze him into leaving by setting Bully Jake on to him. I was tumbled to dot already, 
Fritz replied. But der first one, what attempted, it didn't make so much success. No, but that ain't saying you'll have as big a luck next time. You see, his honor, Mr. Grayville, owns most of the property hereabouts, and he's as big feeling as a duke, and won't allow no one around except what bows to his will. Well, we will see about that, Fritz muttered. I thinks they don't vas make much bulldoze in me. I want to ask you one question. Don't this man Grayville be Captain Gregg, der smuggler? The fat host of the lion's paw gave a start. The question was evidently something of a surprise to him. Why, no, of course not. Whatever put such an idea into your head, young man? Greg the smuggler is said to be one of the worst characters along the Atlantic coast, and at the same time the most successful in his line of business. Grayville is a man who would scorn to stoop at such work, and moreover he is said to be immensely rich in ready cash, though his landed property is mortgaged to its full value. Fritz accepted this explanation without reply, but his mind was still little changed in the matter. I dinks Greg and Grayville vas von und der same parties, he muttered, und shall not give up dot opinion until I can have further proof von way or de order. As soon as the gloaming of the evening began to settle over the quiet little hamlet, he left the tavern and sauntered down the street toward the Honorable Granby Grayville's residence, whither most of the villagers had already wended their way. On arriving at the front of the handsome lawn, with its winding walks, large shade trees, beds of flowers, and attractive residence, Fritz paused to survey the scene that was spread out before him. Here and there, dotted about among the shade trees, were tables spread with tempting viands, to which the villagers were freely helping themselves, and to the flowing pictures of ale that were passed around by several of the village maidens. A couple of Italians were making music upon violin and harp, which sounded weird and enchanting. Children were playing and romping about the grounds. Chinese lanterns were strung about among the lower branches of the trees, and altogether it was a festive and attractive scene. From his position outside the fence, Fritz could see nothing of either Grayville or the alleged countess, and he resolved to enter the grounds for that purpose, which he accordingly did, and sauntered about leisurely, as if he had a perfect right to be there by invitation. Although many curious glances were leveled at him, he paid no attention to them, and after walking around a little while, he leaned up against a tree and looked on, studying every face within the reach of his gaze. Presently there was a shout among the assembled villagers, and upon this the door of the mansion opened, and Mr. Grayville came forth upon the grounds with the countess leaning upon his arm. His honor was attired in a suit of immaculate white duck, with a massive gold chain strung across his vest, and a superb diamond pin upon his shirt front. The countess was a Frenchwoman of some three and thirty years, with a thin, angular face, bead-like black eyes, and hair to match, and a thin, compressed mouth, which when she laughed showed two rows of pearly teeth. She also wore an abundance of paint and powder upon her face, and what with her rich attire of silk, lace, and diamonds, was a striking and peculiar-looking personage, a woman who looked crafty and capable of mischief. As soon as she and the Honorable Grayville advanced upon the lawn, the villagers arose from the tables, and the women curtsied low, while the men swung their hats and sent up a rousing cheer. The Countess and her escort then moved about here and there, with a pleasant word for all, and a bidding for them all to continue their feast. As they passed near where Fritz stood leaning against the tree, Grayville gave him a sharp, stern glance and said, "'Ah, who are you and what do you want here, sir?' "'Nothing in particular,' Fritz replied, returning his stare calmly. "'I only see what you vas half picnicking. Won't I come in to look on?' "'Then be gone, sir, at once. I allow no loafers around here. Go, I say!' And then they passed on. Fritz did not go, however, but retained his position in defiance. "'George Washington made this a free country, and I won't go till I gets ready,' he muttered. It was not long, however, before he was hastily approached by a man, and that man was no less a person than the same flashily attired individual who had taken the young woman, Madge, away from the hotel at Atlantic City. "'Hello! Get out of this, you loafer!' he cried, seizing Fritz by the shoulder roughly. How many times do you have to be told to go? The governor said go. Now if you don't light out, I'll make your heels break your neck. Will you, though? 
Fritz grinned, wrenching loose and standing on the defensive. Just keep your hands off from me, Griffith Gregg, or I will knock der whole top off your nose off. What, you vagabond! You compare me with the smuggler's son? I'll thump your skull for that piece of impudence. And he was as good as his word, for raising a stout cane he carried, he brought it heavily down upon the young detective's head. For a moment Fritz was nearly stunned, but he quickly recovered and sprung at his assailant pluckily. "'Oh, you snoozer!' he cried. "'I will black your eye mit blue for dot!' And he did deal the honorable son two severe black whacks between the eyes, in rapid succession, which had the effect to land him on his back on the ground. "'Thump me on der head, will you?' Fritz cried, standing over him, ready to give him another rap if he attempted to rise. "'I'll pet you a half a dollar you will got left on dot. "'Let me up, you dastardly loafer!' Young Grayville raved, not daring to rise under the existing circumstances. "'I'll murder you for this! I'll... I'll...' "'Got your head broke. Off you come at your foolishness round me!' Fritz cried. "'I'll let you out, though, as I must go!' He saw a half a dozen of the village roughs coming toward the spot, and knew he was ill-prepared to battle with all of them. So with a few dexterous bounds he leaped away out of the yard and ran swiftly down to the beach. Finding that they did not follow him, he soon after made his way up the street again, to the tavern, and went into the room which had been assigned to him. "'I bet there will be some troubles before I got through miss this business,' he muttered. "'But I was der man who will come out der winder.' He was soon off in a sound sleep, from which he, hours later, awakened with a violent start. The scene was changed. He was not in the tavern on the bed but instead was bound hand and foot and lying in the bottom of a boat. End of chapter 7but it did not take him long to come to one conclusion on the matter, that he had been captured at night, thrust into the frail boat and set adrift on the ocean. Who had been the authors of the job? There could be no doubt in his mind about that. The Grayvilles, or the Greggs, as he believed they were, were anxious to have him leave the neighborhood, and had probably, through their agents, caused his removal in this very promiscuous manner. By an effort, he sat up in the little boat and gazed around him. He was now some distance from the beach, beyond the white-capped breakers, and, as the tide was receding, the frail craft was of course drifting farther and farther from land each moment, a reflection that might have caused any one a start, while to Fritz, bound and helpless, it was the next thing to being alarming. Felt by Jiminy Dunder, was his explanation as he gazed dolefully around him. If I don't vos in a doyful of a fix, then I don't want a cent. They've come fun cute game offer me, and I'll bet a half a dollar I go down der same throat vot Jonah did, der vales. Vondervich von of dem vellers put up der shop on me. I'd like to punch his nose. Reckon it vos dot feller whose eyes I blacked mit der jersey plue up at der picnic. I wonder vot der places vot a feller can do anyhow. There was a sorry prospect for his being able to do anything much toward helping himself from the unenviable situation in which he had been placed. He was unable to use his hands or feet, and was therefore helpless and at the mercy of the wild waters over which he was drifting. Did he have use of hands and feet, he was not yet out of danger, for the boat was without oars, and the distance to the land was so great as to make it a daring attempt to breast the outgoing tide in a struggle to reach the shore by swimming. Still, it seemed the only hope for him, if by any way he could free himself from the straps which bound him, and he was not the one to despair without first proving to his satisfaction that it was the only thing left for him to do. Therefore, he set to work industriously in an attempt to loosen the bonds from his hands, Luckily, they were not bound behind his back, which was one advantage, as he could use his teeth upon them. But being leather straps, he made slow headway, nibbling at the strap around his hand. But little by little it yielded, so that after a while a violent wrench broke it asunder, and his hands were free. "'By chimney! Dot ish good, anyhow!' he muttered, making haste to unloosen his feet. 
now their next things is some dings else how is i going to cut back mit their shore it was an all-important question the boat was perhaps a mile farther from shore than when he first had estimated the distance i don't know vedder i can swim dot verder or not he muttered doubtfully but supposin der whale or der doyful fish catch old mit mine poot leg and suck me in under der water vat a doyful of a fix i'd be in den if only i had some paddles i vould have no troubles getting to shore vid der boat he was in the midst of these reflections when he heard a shout farther out at sea and for the first time beheld dimly a dusky object floating in the water not far ahead of him hello who you vas and vat you want fritz shouted in answer i am a poor devil more or less drowned and can't hang on to this barrel much longer be you man or devil for heaven's sake hurry along with your boat all right i vill be there in der sweetness pie and pie keep a stiff upper lip until i got you soon the young detective replied heartily there's nothing like hang on at their critical minute kneeling and leaning over the front part of the boat he used his hands as propellers and in this way was able to improve the slow progress of his light craft to some extent and in a few moments was alongside the barrel on top of which a drenched human was balancing himself at a glance fritz perceived who it was hartley he exclaimed in surprise yes what's left of me the senate smuggler replied clambering into the boat thank heaven you came along just as you did for my grip wouldn't hold out much longer well i should think not i'd given you up ash dead how is it that you vant vos killed by der smugglers it's no fault of theirs hardly replied grimly they chucked me under night afore last miles out at sea supposing my hands and feet were bound and heavy stone tied to my head but while they were rowing me out i contrived to loosen up matters so that i was really free the minute i struck water but i went under all the same to deceive them when they headed for shore i arose to the surface and after swimming about until nearly exhausted i caught on to this empty cask which has in one sense been my salvation by the tides i have been carried quite near to shore but my lower limbs being numb by remaining so long in the water i dared not attempt to swim ashore and the outgoing tide has carried me out again not so far as it would however if i had not struggled shoreward constantly but how come you out here in this frail shell even without oars fritz explained as far as he had known and hartley scowled there'll be a reckoning for someone he said if i ever succeed in getting ashore but there's not much prospect of that unless we can get some oars or something to pull ashore with the tide will begin to ebb in before a great while too i have one idea fritz said if we can get their peril apart we might do some things vid their staves what you think about dot good idea we can easily get the staves hartley drew up the barrel alongside the boat and soon had it knocked to pieces and four of the staves secured now then for sure he cried when we get there i'll leave you on business for a few hours after which i will join you and we will work together against the gregg gang we will paddle to land on the lower side of the bluff as it wouldn't be particularly healthy for me to land in front of the village you can and in fact had better keep shady in the vicinity of the old rookery on the bluff and i will join you as soon as possible accordingly they paddled as rapidly toward the beach as their strength would permit by the time it was daybreak they had landed below the bluff here they drew the light boat upon the beach and hartley said i'll leave you now but we'll return in the course of a few hours all right i will remain in their neighborhood fritz replied and then the young smuggler clambered up the side of the bluff and was soon gone from view i wonder what der veller ish up to now fritz muttered after he had gone there is something he was going to do vot he ain't particular about my knowing some things about i haf half a notion dot he ain't vos so nice a feller vot i first thought und i vould be much surprised if he vould give me away off he got a chance but oh i vill keep watch of him i've got der smugglers under der kidnapper spotted und i'll bet a half a dollar i don't vos be some centuries till i get em trapped in der meantime there is something i want to investigate this was something he had noticed as he and hartley had paddled into the shore from the ocean 
In about the center of the bluff, at the water's edge, as it faced the open Atlantic, was a dark hole of considerable size, which looked as if it might lead to a cavern in the hill. If Hartley knew of its existence, he had kept it a secret. But our German detective had noticed it, and resolved to see where the aperture led to. Under any other circumstances, he would not have given it a second thought. But the fact that the smugglers held out in this vicinity, of which he now had no doubt, gave that hole in the bluff more than ordinary significance. Jumping into the boat, he paddled off once more into the water, and headed toward the front of the bluff. Not knowing what danger he might unexpectedly run into, he had drawn his revolver, which, strangely enough, his captors had not taken from him, and placed it on the stern seat beside him. Working silently but steadily along the face of the bluff, which was quite perpendicular, he soon came before the aperture, and headed his boat into it. Mr., or, as he styled himself, Honorable Granby Granville, sat in his private study this same morning, engaged in smoking a cigar, as he rocked in an easy chair and gazed out through an open glass door upon the pretty lawn. That his thoughts were of an unpleasant nature was evident by a frown which disfigured his florid countenance. And this frown did not lessen, but rather increased, as there suddenly appeared in the doorway no less a wild-looking personage than Silly Sue, whom Fritz had encountered upon the beach. She made a grimace and a sort of jerky bow as she saw his honor, and then stood staring at him in a strange manner. "'Well,' he growled angrily, "'what brings you here?' "'What all this brings me here?' she replied with a chuckle. "'I want to come back and play up high cockalorum like my big-feeling sister. "'Spose that's silly, too, ain't it, Daddy?' "'No more than your accursed obstinacy, you fool,' was the severe reply. "'You well know the only terms that can ever restore you as a member of my family. "'But I won't accept them. "'Then clear out. "'You shall never be anything to me until you surrender the stolen money. "'Bah! "'It ain't yours. "'You're a bad, wicked man, and you got it wickedly, and get all your wealth wickedly. "'And the more you get, the wickeder you get. "'Get out. "'I'd cut my head off, sillies, I am, before I give you up the money. "'Curses on your mulishness.' Ah, I know you cherish the most fatherly regard for me. If it wasn't for the hope that I will some day restore your lost ten thousand, you'd had me drowned months ago. By the way, old man, what have you done with my feller? Your fellow? Yes, Hal Hartley. How should I know anything about him? Oh, you should know better. Oh, you wicked monster. Take care, girl. No, I won't take care. And her eyes flashed in defiance of his anger. I ain't a bit afraid of you because I can outrun any dog in the town, and I know what's become of Hal. Your tools took him out and chucked him under. But, ha, uh, ha, uh, he's all right. Grayville started a little. What foolishness is this of yours? Oh, only silliness, of course, she laughed loudly. But Hal's all right, and now that his scruples have had a pickle, I'll allow he'll come around to my cherished plan, and we'll make it warm for you. What? You dare to threaten me? Didn't I tell you I'd go for you if you didn't reform? Well, I must be off. How's my stately sister? How's the countess? Ha, 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 shoot her. She's an old hag with a glass eye and false teeth. The future Mrs. G. Bah! Such a model private excursion steamer, too. Still, it serves its purpose. I'm off now. Just come up to spice your breakfast. Better mend your ways. The way of the transgressor is hard. Bye-bye. Yours truly, Silly Sue. And then, with a wild laugh, she vanished. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Fritz to the Front by Edward L. Wheeler This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kurt Ziegler Fritz's Discovery let us return to our ventriloquist detective and his venturesome expedition. In heading the boat into the opening in the bluff, he had no idea how his venture would terminate, but was urged on by a great curiosity to explore the spot, feeling sure that it had some connection with the smuggler's league. The height of the aperture was insufficient to admit the passage of the boat with him sitting up, so putting the boat under headway, he laid down and thus glided in. In high tide this opening, he concluded, was covered by water, while in extreme low water the beach must be bare in front of the bluff, 
as the water at this juncture now was quite shallow. He almost immediately emerged into a cave in the heart of the bluff. It was as large as a couple of good-sized rooms, and looked as if the waters of many years had eaten it out. The work of man, however, was seen in the planks overhead, which, resting on wooden supports, held the roof in place. The water reached about midway into the chamber, and from its edge the pebbly ground ascended to the farther side of the cave, where a narrow aperture branched off, evidently cut as a passageway by the hand of man. Grounding his boat, Fritz stepped out and took a survey of his surroundings. "'This don't look as if it was a healthy place at high tide, but I reckon dat it was der place where they run in smuggled goods,' he mused. "'Dot passage probably leads to a higher and drier place.' Holding his revolver ready for use in case of emergency, he stole softly toward the subterranean passage with a view to exploring it. It was a dark, uninviting tunnel of just sufficient width and height to admit of a person's passage, and looked as if it might have no connection with any other chamber, as he could see no light to indicate its terminus. Nothing daunted, however, he entered it and walked along softly, ready for any surprise. A score of steps he went, and then emerged into what he concluded was another large subterranean chamber, but where all was of Stygian darkness. Luckily, he had a close metal pocket box of matches with him, and lighting one after another, he discovered a half a dozen lamps in brackets around the chamber side. One of them he soon lit, when he proceeded to inspect his situation. As before stated, the sides of the cavern were walled up like a cellar, and in size it was a hundred and fifty feet square, by ten or twelve in height. The ceiling overhead was planked, and these supported by rude pillars resting upon the ground floor, as in the outer cave. Here and there, scattered about, were heaps of straw, pieces of wooden boxes and canvas, and occasionally a bottle, or a piece of damaged silk or lace. At the opposite side of this chamber was a round hole in the ceiling, similar to a well, down through which hung a rope ladder to the floor. This seemed to indicate that either there was another chamber overhead, or else this was a means of access to the open air. In the stone wall at either side of the room were doorways supplied with strong, grated iron doors, which were fastened with padlocks and chains. "'Well, I be chiggered off dis don't vas just like a regular prison,' Fritz ejaculated. "'Und dis be der place where der smugglers unpack their goods.' I thought I would discover some things, if I come here. Wonder if they have got somebody shut up mit themselves. Dot wouldn't be so much of a cell neither, if I am any judge. Taking down the lamp, he proceeded to inspect the matter. Approaching the right-hand dungeon, he peered in. The place evidently was empty. Crossing the cavern to the door of the other, to his surprise he saw that this dungeon was occupied. Upon a rude cot bed, a woman was stretched, apparently fast asleep. As her face was turned from his view, he could not tell whether she was young or old, pretty or ugly, but he was strangely impressed. Her size, form, clothing, all aroused his suspicions that it really was the Leadville man's runaway daughter, Madge Thornton, or Thurston, as she had called herself. He was staggered a moment by the very thought. Hello, wake up! "'Who you vas?' he shouted, rattling the door. The woman gave a violent start and sat up on her cot with a gasp. It was indeed the speculator's lost daughter. "'Good! Dot was a nest egg for me!' was the thought that flashed through his mind as he remembered the offered reward. "'Who are you? What do you want?' the bride of Major Atkins demanded eagerly as she arose from her bed and stepped falteringly toward the door. "'Well, I am Fritz.' "'You remember der chap Fritz, don't you?' "'Oh, yes, yes. You are a friend to me. "'Oh, say that you are, and that you have come to rescue me "'and take me back to Papa.' "'Well, I should snigger dot dot vas about der size of der circumstance,' "'the young detective grinned. "'You don't vas like this hotel, then?' "'Oh, no, no, I shall die if I remain here. "'Open the door. Take me from this terrible place. "'Oh, please do this, sir, and I will always love you.' "'Nixie, you mustn't do dot,' Fritz replied with a serious expression. "'Or you will half mine gal Rebecca in your vool. "'She is jealous, is Rebecca, and it makes her matter as a hornet be, 
if I even looks sweet at a potato bug. That ish a fact. But I will get you out all the same, if I can, which I don't know so much about, as their door was fastened tighter as a brick. You see, your old dad, he was sent me down this way to look for you, and I tells him I find you, just like a pook. I was regular snoozer at finding things what don't belong to me. My father sent you? Oh, joyful news! Tell me, tell me, where is my father? And she clasped her hands, her face and eyes aglow with eagerness. There was evidently nothing dazed or somnambulistic about her now. Well, there last, I seed your old man. He vast at their place where you got married, but he left for Long Branch to rustigate and keep vetter an eye out for you. Well, I took their rear trail and skittered up their game. You see, their old man tells me, if I find you and their money what you stole from him, he would give me five thousand dollars. How was that? He was just their man I have been wanting to meet for a long while. But how about their money? It is where no earthly hands but mine can find it, except I give the directions, the girl replied with evident enthusiasm over the fact. When I left home to come east and marry Major Atkins, I was in a state of half-insanity, or somnambulism, they called it, and took the money, and when I came to my senses, found it in my possession. It seems I have learned since that before leaving for the east, and at the same time when I was in my dazed state, Atkins said that he had a large roll of money in my father's safe, and that when I came I should bring it. And to my surprise, I have also since learned that it was not the first somnambulistic theft I have been guilty of. Upon discovering the large sum upon my person, I put it in a place where it would be safe, and came on to marry Major Atkins, whom I imagined myself to be in love with. We met. It was he who took me away from the hotel, and we were married, as I supposed at the time, but it has since been proved a base deception. Almost immediately after your departure, he demanded the money of me. Well, you guff it up to him, I suppose? No, I did not, she replied, with an exhibition of spirit. I told him I didn't have it, which was true. But he wouldn't believe that, saying that he learned I had the money in my possession on leaving home. Then I got angry and told him I wouldn't give it to him if I did have it. This in turn enraged him, and he declared the marriage to be a sham and that if I didn't surrender the money, he would kill me. I defied him and dared him to do it, whereupon he and the bogus minister seized upon me and searched me, but failed to find the money. The monster, Atkins, then knocked me down, and I became insensible. When I awoke, it was in this terrible underground place. He has been here several times and threatened me, and alternated the matter by promising to make me his wife in reality and the mistress of a princely home if I would give up the money. But having found out what a villain he is, I have firmly refused. Dot was right. He will give him der doyful fun of these days, or at least I will, for smuggling. I don't know whether I can get you out of here or not. I ought to have some tools, as it don't was some little shop breaking iron mit der feller's hands. Oh, do try and release me in some way. I do so want to get free. Und I know dat. But you see, it was harder as breaking their constitution to break this chain. It was no easy job, indeed. The chain was several feet in length and made of short, stout welded links. The padlock, too, was a formidable affair, such as could not easily be broken, and Fritz did not have any keys with him. He was stuck for once in not knowing how to proceed and was just cogitating over what was best to do when he noticed something that caused him to start. On glancing toward the rope ladder, he perceived that it was moving. Someone was descending it. Did he remain here, discovery was inevitable, and discovery would probably destroy all possibility of rescuing Madge. These thoughts occurred to him like a flash. Shh! Someone is coming, and I must hide, he said to Madge in a whisper. Then he hurried softly across the chamber into the dark passage, where he paused at a point where he could see without being seen. El bot dot it vas der feller whose eye I blacked, he muttered. And sure enough, he was right. A moment later, Major Atkins, alias Young Grayville, alias Griffith Gregg, came down the ladder into the cavern, 
his eyes yet showing unmistakable evidence of power of Fritz's shoulder hits. "'What the devil's all this noise down here?' he demanded, approaching the door of Madge's dungeon. "'I thought I heard voices conversing.' "'You probably heard me singing, Sir Monster,' Madge retorted sarcastically. "'You know I am in good humor for vocalism.' "'The devil take you! It wasn't singing. It was talking I heard.' Ah, perhaps you heard me saying over threats of what I'll do when I get free. Now what will you do? I'll claw your eyes out. Then I'll tie you and give you a thrashing with a bullwhip. Ah, threaten what you like. I'll guarantee you'll remain here until I get your amiable dad's swag. But you will never get it. Won't I? When you begin to rot in your dungeon and your tongue hangs out of your mouth for want and food of water, I fancy you'll come to terms. "'But I won't, though. "'Oh, we shall see. "'I won't argue with you. "'At the present moment I want to find out "'who it was I heard you conversing with.' "'And to her horror he made for the dark passage. "'Fritz, too, was considerably concerned, "'and began to make a rapid and stealthy retreat "'to the other chamber. "'On arriving there another thing startled him. "'The tide had set in, "'and the hole in the face of the bluff "'was so nearly filled as to make escape "'with the boat impossible.' End of chapter 9Here she is. What do you want of her? 
a merry voice cried, and the elfin danced laughing out from behind a huge boulder at Fritz's rear, where she had been concealed, evidently playing the spy. "'What do you want of silly Sue, Irishman?' "'I was no Irishman,' Fritz retorted. "'I am a Dutchman.' "'Get out! You're pure Irish. But that ain't the point. What do you want of me?' I wanted to inquire how far is it to their nearest telegraph station. Oh, a good ways inland. The road you see in front of the old house on the bluff leads direct to it. If you want to send a message, I'll send it for you. You will? Yes. I'll hook one of Dad's horses from the pasture and ride to town. Guess I know what you propose doing. What? You are a detective, and you have discovered that my dad and his smugglers live around here, and you want to send for help to arrest them. How vas you know all dot? Oh, I'm silly enough to guess it, and I hope you'll do it. They're a hard gang and a wicked gang, and they hate me worse than poison, because I'm honest, unlike the rest of them. Captain Gregg and Honorable Granby Greville are their same persons, not? Yes, you're mighty cute to find that out. When some of villagers don't even suspect it, I'm his gal. Is that a fact? Yes, but he don't own me because I denounce his dishonesty. Ha! An old man was found dead on the beach once. The next day my papa had a big sum of money in his possession. I smelled foul play. I stole the money from him and burned it up. Ha! ha. Then he whipped me unmercifully and turned me adrift. But pooh, I don't care. I get along famous, and I'll make fun for the smugglers yet. So if you want me to go to the telegraph station for you, and will give me a few shillings, I'm ready. I give you five dollars, Fritz assured. Bully, the girl assented. Now, just tell me what you want, and I'm yours. Well, I want you to go to the telegraph office and send a message to Tony Fox, care of police headquarters, Philadelphia, telling him to fetch a half dozen men dare this village at once. Can you remember, Dot? Well, you bet I can. I don't forget things easily. Give us your money and I'm off for a wild horseback ride. Fritz accordingly gave her a V-note, and then, after again instructing her what to do, she took her departure by clambering up the bluff. Fritz then lay down upon the sand in the warm sunlight, little dreaming that his plans had been overheard. The Irishman, Pat Grogan, had been concealed behind another boulder, and had overheard every word of Fritz's conversation with Silly Sue. Shortly after her departure, and when sure Fritz was not watching, he stole softly from his place of concealment and up the side of the bluff. Once on top of the bluff, he quickened his pace, descended the opposite side, and hurried toward the village. At the residence of Granby Greyville he paused and entered the spacious lawn. His honor and the countess were seated upon the lawn in front of the house, enjoying the shade of a great tree, and Grogan tipped his hat as he approached them. "'Sure, sir. Tis myself has made a discovery, sir,' he said with a huge grin of satisfaction. "'Ah, indeed, I thought you might be of some use,' his honor replied complacently. "'What is the nature of your discovery, Grogan?' "'Sure, sir. It's concerning the girl you set me to watchin'. "'As I expected. Curse her! What new devilment has she been up to?' "'Sure I did cape a civil eye on her, as yous told me to, and a bit ago she met a Dutchman on the beach. And it's a grand plot that be after an organizin'. On the likes of the Dutchman, he a wanted to ba sendin a telegraph to Philadelphia for the detectives, and the gal, she did tell him for a V she would stale a horse fornst your pasture and be carrying the message for him herself, whereat he forked over the cash and she skipped, bedad. His honor listened, his face growing purple with passion. May all the fury seize that obstinate and meddlesome little wretch, he hissed. She seems determined to ruin me. No amount of whippings have ever served to make her like other girls. Why didn't you stop her, Pat? "'Sure it was yourself as told me to be doing naught else but watching her. "'True, I had forgotten. "'She has probably gone so far that it would be next to useless to attempt to overhaul her now. "'Do you think you could mount a horse and overtake her, Pat?' "'Be dad, no. It's sorry a horse I can ride, Your Honor.' "'Then ascertain from the ostler the location of the pasture, and when she returns, capture her. "'I'll give you ten dollars for the job.' "'Bad says to me if I don't do it.' And what shall I be doing to her after I caught her? 
then take her to the old mansion on the bluff and wait until i come ouch holy mother i'll not go where the skeleton is nary a time nor need you what time intervenes between your arrival and mine you can spend outside but look sharp she don't escape you sure it's meself as will ba doing that same then grogan executed a grotesque bow and took his departure toward the stable while greyville turned toward the countess the devil will be to pay now as i suspected that dutchman is a spy and having suspicioned or ferreted out some knowledge concerning the league has sent for his fellow watchdogs in less than two days we shall be in the clutches of the law unless we make a break for liberty at once oh there's no particular reason for hurry when we find there is danger we can easily escape the countess said calmly how if we wait until their arrival it will be too late by no means my steamboat lies out but a short distance and we can board it and sail for la belle france in defiance what without unloading ah what are a few thousand dollars to life besides the goods will sell again for full value at havre End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Fritz to the Front by Edward L. Wheeler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. A Father's Brutality. After the departure of Silly Sue, Fritz sunned himself until his garments were dried, then rising, he began to cast about him for something to eat. I don't know better I go back mit der tavern or not, he mused. I dinks dot vas an unhealthy place and yet i would like some things to eat very bad climbing to the top of the bluff he passed the old mansion and followed the country road for some distance in hopes of finding an orchard or watermelon patch and he was successful about a mile distant he came to a good-sized orchard near no human habitation and hastily made a raid on it with the result of discovering all the luscious eating harvest apples he could carry filling his pockets he made his way back to the old rookery and sat down upon the front step to finish his meal. "'I wonder what's become of der villain I kicked mit under der jaw,' he muttered. "'I think I must have dislocated him, or I should a seed him. I wonder where der mouth of der well is. Anyhow, what they come up through, it must be somewhere where der house stands, und probably hidden.' After he finished his meal on apples, he entered the old dwelling, with a view to giving it another exploration. Passing through the lower hall, he tried each door opening off from it, but found them all locked as before. What they contained he could therefore not learn, except by bursting them open or unlocking them, which he had no way of doing. Finding no success, downstairs he went upstairs, remembering that he had only tried the doors of part of the upper rooms on his previous visit, the second one being the assembly chamber containing the swinging head of ill-fated Bill Budge he shunned this apartment now and passed along the corridor the first and second doors he tried were locked like those below the third door however was unfastened and opening it he entered a large unfurnished apartment containing but one window which looked out upon the ocean noticing a card tacked upon the wall opposite the door fritz advanced to read what was written upon it but that he was destined never to do Halfway across the room, he got, then the floor sunk quickly beneath him, and he went down, down, down. He had stepped upon a trap, which had evidently been prepared for occasional stragglers, and he was the unsuspecting victim, until too late to save himself. Down, down he went, into empty space, until he struck heavily upon a hard floor, and lay for a moment in a heap, his senses partly leaving him. When he recovered consciousness, he arose to his feet. He was in utter darkness and in a place where the air was close and stifling. What kind of den had he fallen into, he could not ascertain by looking, at least. Later that day, Mr. Granby Greyville left his handsome residence and made his way to the bluff, accompanied by her ladyship, the countess. There was a terrible expression of stern resolve upon his countenance, and in his grasp he carried an ugly-looking cart-whip, which looked as if it were capable of inflicting dire pain in the hands of a human brute. Arriving at the top of the bluff, they found Grogan, the Irish delegate, seated upon the doorstep of the old house, while lying upon the ground in front of him was the girl. 
Sue, bound hand and foot, but none the less defiant for that fact, as was evident by the contemptuous curl of her lip and the indignant, wicked flash of her eyes. A little shiver went over her, though, when she saw the countess, the man she knew as her father, and the whip he carried. "'Sure it's meself as cotched her,' Grogan cried, as Greyville approached. "'But it's the devil's own time I had at it, be dad, and if yous don't believe it, you can look at me face. But Gora, she scratched and bit, and fit like the very devil's imp she is.' and the Hibernian rubbed his torn and bruised visage dolefully. "'So you're caged, are you, my young tigress?' the smuggler captain demanded, gazing down at the girl wrathfully. "'I'll see that you never break loose hereafter.' "'Bah!' the girl retorted in contempt. "'I'm not afraid of you, you rufflingly wretch. If you do carry a whip, you can whip me, pound me, stamp me into the earth, but you can't intimidate me. I'll despise and defy you to the longest day I live.' We shall see. I've made up my mind to cease dealing mildly with you, and instead treat you to the harshness your foolishness demands. It's time you were broken in, and I'm going to compel you to submission to my will and to obedience, or I'm going to kill you. Kill if you like. I'll still defy you. You cannot make me obey a monster like you, even though you are my father. I despise you, hate you, you inhuman wretch. A good flogging will bring back your affection. By the way, I understand that by way of amusing yourself you have become the consort of a Dutch detective, and by way of furthering his game have just been to telegraph for an additional force of the devils. Now do you know what I'm going to do? Anyone might guess. Brutal cowards always carry whips. Yes, I'm going to whip you within an inch of your life. Then if you promise me to ever after obey me, and tell me where to find the money you stole from me, I will let you go. But if you refuse, I will kill you, and end the trouble. Grogan, lash her securely to yonder post. The Irishman obeyed by raising her and roping her to a post which had been used for a hitching post at some remote period. Sue's face was very pale now, and she trembled in dread of the cruel lash. It was not the first time she had been whipped by him and she well knew what a merciless wretch he was. Greyville threw off his coat now, and seized the heavy whip firmly, not a tithe of pity expressed in his stern, cruel face. "'Beg now,' he cried. "'Tell me where the money is, and promise future obedience and proper conduct, or I'll give it to you.' "'Never! I'll die first. Sue gasped. The next instant the wretch struck her with all his might, following one blow with another, until he had struck her twenty, the last one being upon the top of the head, with the butt of the whip. White as death was Sue, but her eyes flashed bravely, her face was defiant, but she never uttered a moan or a cry of pain. Now, now maybe you'll come to time, the smuggler roared, more like some enraged wild beast than a human being, in his demoniac fury. Now will you tell and promise? Never, monster, was the low, piteous gasp. Then the eyes of the poor outcast closed. She had fainted, unable longer to endure the agony. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of Fritz to the Front by Edward L. Wheeler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. A PITIFUL END The situation of Fritz was to him a decidedly gloomy one, as owing to the impenetrable darkness his eyesight was of no use whatever. He did not know either if it was safe to stir, as there might be another trap which he would fall into, and go headlong down into some other pit. But he resolved to test the matter and feel out the boundaries of his new prison at once, groping about inch by inch and trying the floor in front of him before trusting the weight of his body upon it, he soon came to a plastered wall, and concluded by that that he still remained in the building, having probably only fallen to the first floor. "'Well, dot don't va so bad as I first expected,' he muttered, feeling a little more assured. "'I thought I was going way down to der blaze where they manufacture firecrackers. Der next question, is there any outlet to this prison, I wonder?' Keeping his hands upon the wall, he walked several times around the dark apartment without pausing. "'There is not one der door or winder, nor all of any kind,' 
he finally muttered. I would not have such a house for a gift. The room indeed appeared to be barren of those accessories, as far as he was able to learn by the sense of feeling, and it would seem that it was thus purposely prepared for a prison. Well, I guess I might as well prepare to imitate their example of Dr. Tanner, and go without some things to eat for forty years or so, Fritz muttered, feeling his stomach dolefully, for the apples had far from satisfied his appetite. But if possible, I must get out of here, somehow, before Fox and her boys get here. Just how he was to do it furnished him a serious subject to ponder on. Curse the girl, she's fainted, the smuggler chief cried, pausing in his horrible work. Perhaps she's playing off to escape punishment, the countess suggested with a malicious smile. The American mademoiselle is very deceitful. Faint or no faint, she shall get all that her stubborn resistance demands. Grayville growled mercilessly, and he raised the whip and struck her another stinging blow. "'Stop! Strike that girl again, and I'll kill you!' a voice cried not far in their rear, and turning they beheld a stranger rushing up, a pair of cocked revolvers in hand. "'Furies!' Grayville gasped, turning pale. "'Mon Dieu! What's to pay? Let's fly!' from the countess. "'No, we will stand our ground!' the smuggler hissed. The newcomer stood before them with stern, accusing gaze and a face flushed from his run. "'Devils!' he cried. "'What is the meaning of this brutal scene? Explain instantly!' It was the Leadville speculator Thornton who spoke, and there was grim business expressed in his tone. "'What right have you to intrude in what is none of your business?' Grayville demanded sourly. "'Eh? Hey, I'll show you, you brutal puppy. Don't give me any of your lip or I'll blow your brains out.' Why, cuss my boots, you're as bad as the dog engines on the frontier. I presume I have a right to chastise my own child, sir, when her conduct deserves it. That's not your child, Gary Gregg. I know you. You are the wretch I have been longing to meet these ten years. You know me? The smuggler cried in amazement. Why, I know you, the westerner cried. You are the worthless devil who trapped Minnie Gray into a secret marriage years ago, and after leaving with her a couple of years and abusing her, left her in poverty, to live with a woman you had previously married. And incurred your enmity by winning your sweetheart away from you, Greg sneered mockingly. Be that as it may, you are responsible for a good woman's death, and you shall answer for it. Tell me, sir, is this poor child you have been beating the daughter of Minnie Gray? If you like, yes. Then curse you. Leave this spot at once. If you don't want me to shoot you down, I'll take care you never strike her again. Go, I say, or I'll kill you without hesitation. There was a stern glare in the spectator's eyes that betokened danger, and accompanied by the countess and Grogan, the smuggler chief hurried away. As soon as they had gone, Mr. Thornton cut the bonds that held Silly Sue to the post and laid her tenderly down upon the soft grass. Hurrying down to the beach, he procured some water in his hat and, returning, dashed it in her face. But although he did this and chaffed her hands and wrists, she did not open her eyes. Her breath came in stifled gasps, and her heart beat slowly. "'By heaven, I believe they have killed her,' Mr. Thornton muttered, feelings of terrible rage swelling within him. "'The equal of this brutality is seldom, even among the red devils on the frontier.' Ah, oh, Gary Gregg, if this poor child dies, you shall pay bitterly for her life, or my name is not Thornton. He continued faithfully in his endeavors to bring her back to consciousness, but all to no avail. While he was thus engaged, there came sounds of rapid footsteps, and Hal Hartley dashed up, flushed and excited. Great heaven! What is the matter with Susie? he demanded, on seeing her lying on the ground so cold and white. I fear she is dying, young man. Mr. Thornton replied solemnly. I cannot restore her to consciousness. Was she anything to you, sir? Indeed, yes. She was all the world to me, poor child, and we were to be married one of these days, Hartley replied, kneeling beside her with tears in his eyes. Susie, oh, Susie, my little waif, can't you look up and speak to me? The girl slowly opened her eyes and gazed up at him with a loving smile. Yes, Hal, I know. I am dying. Hal! Where is Fritz? I don't know, darling. I have not seen him since morning. Well, when you see him, tell him I sent the message and got an answer that the detectives would come. The detectives? 
Yes, I went for him to telegraph for them, and he gave me five dollars. It is in my pocket, Hal. You can have it, to get me a little plain stone for my grave. But, Susie, you can't be dying. Tell me, what is the matter? She has been cruelly beaten. I came here a few moments ago and drove off the devils, but I fear I came too late, Mr. Thornton explained sadly. It was Papa, you know, she added, as Hartley uttered a cry of astonishment. He discovered the errand I had done, and had a big Irishman capture me and bring me here. Then he and the Countess came, and I was tied to a stake and whipped till I fainted. They have killed me, I guess. I feel as if I'm filling up inside, and something tells me I shall die soon. I hate to leave you, Hal, but I'm not afraid to die. I have always said my prayers, loved the Lord, and been honest, and I know he will receive me. The girl's childish faith and simplicity touched Mr. Thornton as well as young Hartley, and tears flowed freely. The little outcast soon closed her eyes again, her arms about Hartley's neck, as she rested in his embrace, and peaceful expression of contentment upon her face. About sunset she spoke without opening her eyes. How? she said softly. Yes, Susie, he replied. What do you wish? Not much. After I am gone, burn the old house yonder, and break up the smugglers. Yes, Susie. And you'll be a good man, Hal, all your life, so you will join me in heaven? I will try, dearest. Then kiss me good-bye. Convulsed with sobs, the grief-stricken lover obeyed, and just as the last rays of sunset began to fade, Susie breathed her last, expiring without the least appearance of pain, and a faint, peaceful smile upon her lips. For some moments after her death, neither Hartley nor Mr. Thornton spoke, but finally the latter said, She is gone where she will know no more suffering or sorrow, and it is perhaps better so. Is your home nearby? I live in sort of a hut back in the woods, and if you will lend me a hand, we will take her there. The speculator assented, and Hartley procured a wide board, and laid the limp form upon it. Then raising the primitive litter between them, they left the bluff and took to the lonely country road, which they followed until they came to a rude shanty standing in the edge of the woods. They bore their burden into the only room and deposited it upon a couple of stools. Hartley then turned to Mr. Thornton. "'You are a stranger to us, sir,' he said. "'But would you kindly remain here until I can go to a neighboring town and make arrangements for her burial?' "'Certainly, my boy.' Then I will go and send the undertakers at once to take charge of the remains. If I do not return with the undertakers, let them remove the body, and I will see you later, perhaps. He then kissed the lips and forehead of the dead girl and took his departure. Once outside, his whole demeanor underwent a change. His face became stern and hard in its expression, and his eyes gleamed with a wild light that could hardly have been pronounced sane. First the house he muttered between his clenched teeth then i will see to the burial after that revenge words uttered with a power of feeling which bespoke grim resolution hurrying back to the bluff he entered the building and from the pantry brought an oil can and poured oil about in a number of different places applying a lighted match to each as a result bright sheets of flame sprung up and in less time almost than it takes to tell it the interior of the old rookery was on fire in several places. Then, with a wild laugh, he turned and fled from the building and disappeared from the vicinity of the bluff. The old house was doomed, and in the doorless, windowless trap-room, where he had so unexpectedly become imprisoned, was Fritz, in the most unenviable situation one could well conceive. Captain Gregg, as we shall henceforth call him, learned of Silly Sue's death shortly after it occurred through the Irishman, who, while pretending to leave the spot, had scouted around and lurked in the vicinity until Hartley and Mr. Thornton had departed with the body. Greg was both alarmed and surprised when he heard the news and immediately sought the Countess for consultation. He had no idea he had done the girl any fatal bodily injury. If she was dead and the cause of her death came to be known, he well knew that he would be called upon to answer to the law. The countess listened to his recital of Grogan's report, the lines in her thin face growing even harder than their wont. I feared this, she said. You were very much savage. What do you advise? That we remain where we be for the present. 
you say this stranger be an old enemy of yours yes doubly so now from a fact that he is the father of griff's prisoner that's locked up in the dungeon oh this is bad what are busy dutchmen there's no telling perhaps griffith will know when he comes but griffith did not come it was nearly dark in the outer world when he recovered from the terrible blow he had got from fritz's pistol in the cave and staggered to the inner cavern the moment he entered it a smell of burning timbers greeted his nostrils by heaven the house above is burning up i believe he cried rushing to the rope ladder and beginning to climb it rapidly but it only got a few feet up when it gave way and he fell to the ground considerably bruised the devil's to pay now he muttered angrily a fellow will smother down here for a moment the young villain stood irresolute then he approached the door of madge thornton's cell madge he called there was no answer madge he shouted in a louder tone at the same time rattling the door savagely well what do you want she demanded rising from her cot i want to know if you want to escape from this place alive why what's the matter matter enough the old house is burning down and if you don't want to suffocate you must leave this place at once with me well why don't you open the door then he was unlocking the great padlock even as he spoke i am perfectly willing to do so and when you reveal to me the hiding place of your father's money which you had when you left leadville you are free to go he said standing in the doorway are you foolish enough to suppose for one moment i will reveal that if you don't do it curse you i will leave you here to suffocate do so i would cheerfully pay that penalty of my folly in ever having anything to do with you a hundred times rather than submit to your demands then but no i'll release you if you'll give me half of the sum not a cent you detestable wretch curses on your obstinacy you have refused to do what is right and you shall take the consequences stepping back he reclosed the door angrily and hastily relocked the padlock then he left the main chamber for the outer one and jumped into the boat the tide was now on the ebb and the water was now down so that he could row out of the hole into the ocean as soon as he got out a grand sight met his gaze the old house on top of the bluff was in a sheet of lurid flame lighting up the early evening which otherwise was quite dark showers of sparks ascended toward the heavens and the crackling of the dancing blaze made weird music pulling in to shore griffith gregg leaped from the boat and clambered up the side of the bluff the first man he met was thornton of leadville who had fastened up the hut and hurried to the scene of the conflagration as soon as he had discovered the light the recognition was mutual and each uttered a cry at last the speculator cried and bounded forward and seized his enemy by the throat gregg clinched with him and the two men rolled to the ground in a fierce struggle the lurid light of the burning building lighting up the scene like unto the colored fire to some wild exciting drama End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of fritz to the front by edward l wheeler this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kirk ziegler conclusion the struggle was short and decisive supple though the younger greg was he was no match for the man from leadville and it was not long ere mr thornton had his man pinned firmly beneath him so that he could not move by this time the villagers had arrived upon the scene in numbers and stood contemplating the scene in wonder what is the matter here one of them demanded stepping forward who set fire to this building that i am not prepared to say as i just came mr thornton replied but i know that i have captured one of the worst villains living is there an officer of the law among you if so i want him to take this devil into immediate custody and watch well that he don't escape i am a constable but i must first know what charge you have against this young man of highly respected family another villager said charges enough to hang him higher than hammond if you like the speculator cried he has my daughter in prison somewhere in hopes of extorting money from me he is wanted in leadville colorado for no less than three cold-blooded murders and also for horse theft and i've got papers to show for it it's a lie it's a mistake this man is crazy young greg shouted 
I appeal to you for protection, gentlemen. Protection you shall have, sir, by law, if you deserve it, the constable replied, slipping a pair of handcuffs upon the young man's wrists. Now, sir, to Mr. Thornton, permit me to examine your papers. The speculator drew a package of documents from an inside coat pocket, and the officer gave them a critical examination. They are all right, he said, returning them. For the present I will leave the scoundrel in your charge, until I recover my lost daughter, Mr. Thornton said. That you will never do, curse you, Griffith Gregg hissed savagely. You sealed her doom in tackling me, and you may as well put a mourning band around your hat. What? Do you dare tell me my daughter is in peril, sir? Well, that remains to be told. It's according to whether I'm released or not. If not, most assuredly you will never see her or the money she stole, for if I am to answer for all the charges you have preferred against me, I can just as well add a few more without any inconvenience. We shall see about that. I think a rigid search will find her. Officer, remove him to a place of safety until I determine upon a future course of action. The constable accordingly took his departure, marching the younger Greg with him. The fire had by this time gained great headway. It leaped in great crackling volumes from the roof and burst through the sides in fiery forks. The whole interior was a seething furnace of lurid flame, and timbers were already beginning to fall in. "'Where's Silly Sue?' someone cried, and the question went from mouth to mouth. "'She sometimes sleeps in the old house.' "'Silly Sue, as you called her, is dead,' Mr. Thornton announced. "'Dead!' the villagers exclaimed, gathering around him. "'Silly Sue, dead?' "'Yes, dead, and lies in the shanty down the road, belonging to Hal Hartley, who has gone to some neighboring town to arrange for her burial,' the speculator said. Then he related what he knew concerning the brutal whipping she had had at the hands of Greg Sr. A murmur of indignation ran through the crowd as he spoke, and though some of the men did not cry out against the guilty man, the majority were greatly excited. "'Do you swear this is true?' one of the villagers cried angrily. I swear it a hundred times, if you like. If you have any doubts on the matter, it will take but a few moments to examine the poor child's form, upon which welts and bloody cuts yet remain to be seen. That I for one propose we give Grayville as good as he made it out, the man cried, whose name was Tompkins. I always had a private idea he was a villain, and now I need no further proof to confirm it. All in favor of hauling him out and lynching him make manifest by saying I. There was a decisive shout among all but about ten of the men, who maintained a grim silence. "'Lynching is a crime, gentlemen,' Mr. Thornton said. "'In the East, which would render you liable. "'It can do no harm to give the human monster a taste of the whip, however, "'and then turn him over to the rigor of the law.' "'Perhaps you are right,' Tompkins agreed. "'Come along, boys. We'll teach the wretch that he must be civilized, "'if he will live in a civilized country.' and the sturdy villager led off, the whole crowd following in his rear with indignant faces. There was indeed a dark outlook for Captain Gregg. From his library window in the village mansion he was watching the fire, and saw the crowd marching in a funeral-like procession down from the bluff along the beach toward the village. The countess saw, too, and compressed her lips tightly. "'The crisis is coming,' she hissed sharply, so sharply that he started violently. The crowd has heard of the girl's death, and are coming for you. He turned deathly pale. They would show him no mercy, as he had shown none to Susie, he well knew. We must escape from here somehow, he cried. To submit to arrest means death for you as well as myself. How so? Did you not witness the whipping without attempting to interfere? He sneered. They'd string you up as quick as I, especially when investigation came to prove you be Madame Lisette. THE NOTORIOUS FRENCH SMUGGLER. THE WOMAN'S TURN IT WAS TO WHITEN NOW, AND A SUPPRESSED CURSE ESCAPED FROM BETWEEN HER CLENCHED TEETH. I VAS ONE BIG FOOL FOR EVER ANCHORING HERE, OR HAVING YOU FOR ME AGENT, SHE REPLIED. SOMETHING MUST BE DONE, AND THAT VERY QUICK. WHAT SHALL IT BE? THERE IS BUT ONE COURSE, FLIGHT. GO TO MY ROOM AND GET ALL THE MONEY AND JEWELS THERE. WHEN YOU COME BACK I WILL BE READY. She obeyed, and in a very short space of time returned, dressed ready for escape. Leaving the house by the rear door, they skulked hurriedly along a narrow lane. 
This soon brought them out into the country and into an orchard. Without pausing, the chief of smugglers made a wide detour, which finally brought them out upon the beach, half a mile north of the village, and directly opposite the steamer Countess, which lay a good two miles out at sea at anchor. A light rowboat was drawn upon the beach. This Greg pushed off into the water and sprung in, the Countess following him. Then, seizing the oars, he pulled with all his skill and strength toward the steamer. At the same time, a boat manned by half a dozen men pulled out from the beach in front of the village, and this, too, was headed toward the steamer. Ha! Ah, they've suspected our dodge, Greg growled, on discovering the pursuit. Curse them! I did not think discovery of our flight would be made so quickly. Will they reach the boat first? By no means. I've got the start, and the steamer is a good half-mile farther from them than us, if not more. Let us look after Fritz. The roof of the old rookery on the bluff had just fallen in, and millions of sparks go up toward the cloudy sky. Is the young detective still within that old building? He had heard Hartley when he ran through the house, setting fire to it, and had yelled at the top of his voice for assistance. But either Hartley had not heard or did not heed his cries, for no assistance came. Out in the hall, which adjoined the doorless room, the flames soon began to crackle ominously, and the pungent smell of smoke crept through the wall to his nostrils. For a few moments Fritz stood transfixed with horror, as the peril of his situation began to dawn upon him. He knew by the smell that the house was on fire. He knew that if he did not make a hasty escape, he would be consumed in the merciless flames. What was he to do? Really, what was there he could do? He rushed about, scarcely aware what he was doing. Suddenly his foot caught upon something, and he fell violently to the floor. In all his afterlife he could look back with gladness upon that mishap, as it was the means of saving him from an awful death. Quickly scrambling to his feet, he searched the floor. A moment later his hand came in contact with an iron ring. Pulling upon it, he raised a trap in the floor, disclosing a large aperture leading down to another pit below, which he concluded was a cellar. Without pausing to consider what he was doing, he dropped down through the hole. Anything was preferable to the horrible danger above. He landed upon his feet upon a hard bottom of the cellar into which he had leaped. In a moment thereafter there was a crash, and a portion of the rear roof over the cellar fell in. The light of the burning timbers now gave him a view of his situation. The cellar ran under the whole of the house, and was nearly filled with boxes. The only stairway had been covered by the caving-in of the floor, thus closing this avenue of escape. The caving-in, in turn, had been mainly caused by the falling of a heavy girder from the second floor. Directly in front of where Fritz had landed was a large well-like hole in the ground that looked as if it might be very deep and his only wonder was that he had not stepped off into it, in the darkness that had prevailed immediately after he had struck into the cellar. "'I wonder if dot was a well, or is der hole vot leads down to der cavern?' he muttered, peering over the edge. "'If der ladder was der case, I'm all right, providing I can get down. But off it was a well, then I was a gone sucker, sure. I don't see any dings off der rope ladder.' Looking above his head, he however discovered where a staple had been recently drawn out of a joist, and this satisfied him that it had been where the ladder had been fastened to, and that the hole was the same that penetrated into the cavern in the bluff. "'Der next thing vas how to get down there,' he muttered. "'If I jump, like ash not, I break my neck, und den I be ash bad off ash before, if not worse.' There seemed to be no other way of getting down, however and he resolved to take his chances, rather than remain in the cellar and become a target for the fallen fiery timbers. With a prayer for safety, he made the uncertain leap. Down, down, down he went with a velocity that took his breath, and he knew no more except being conscious of striking the earth with a heavy jar. When he recovered his senses, he was in the outer cave, and Madge Thornton was kneeling over him, chafing his hands. The cavern was dense with smoke, and breathing was difficult. Fritz comprehended the situation at once and sat up. "'I was come down like a thousand bricks, eh?' he smiled, feeling of his limbs to learn if any of them were seriously damaged. "'I forgot about where I was going all at once. How you got out of der dungeon?' 
good luck would have it that griffith in his passion should have thrown the bolt of the padlock when the catch was not in so i easily reached out my hand drew the padlock off and got out into the chamber madge replied what is the matter is the old house burning yes we must get out of here or we choke to death off it gets too deep i will swim at you through that hole he accordingly rose to his feet and raising her in his arms he waded toward the aperture and outside of the cavern around to the southern beach the water in the deepest place but reaching to his throat by shiminy dunder i feel just like as if i tickled to death things have turned out so well fritz cried as he placed madge on her feet a while ago i was as good as scuff up or a roasted dutchman now i was out and so was you and i feel better as a spring lamb are you sure we're out of danger well no not exactly sure but i think we will be all right now just you stay here in der shadow off your pluff while i skirmish round und see what's to pay she accordingly did as directed while he clambered up the side of the bluff bent on reconnaissance the first man and only man he met was mr thornton who had hurried back from the village to the bluff as soon as captain gregg was discovered missing to keep watch in the vicinity he uttered a cry of joy as he saw fritz why bless you boy i never expected to see you again he cried shaking the young detective by the hand won't you come pretty near it too you bet a half a dollar mr thornton for i just got out of their building here in time to save mine fool but i have got your daughter and her money was safe what you do not tell me this for a fact fritz well if i don't mistake it was just wait here and i bring you der girl as to der money she was no fool and put it away where she can get it again he vanished only to reappear a few minutes later accompanied by madge then followed a touching scene the speculator received his lost daughter with open arms there were explanations and kisses and tears and laughs, and the reunion was now complete. Leaving them to their joy, let's take a concluding glance at the ocean race, which was in the meantime transpiring. The pursuers saw Greg pull out from the shore as soon as he saw them, and they tugged at their oars with a will. Pull, boys, Tompkins cried from his position at the steering oar. See, the woman waving her handkerchief. That is a signal to the crew on board to fire up, ready to be off. Pull, pull for what you're worth. We must intercept them if possible, before they board. The villagers did pull, with a will, and their boat fairly leaped over the water. Tompkins had guessed the truth. The countess's signal did result in the crew's raising anchor and in unbanking the slumbering fires, for huge volumes of smoke almost immediately began to roll from the smokestacks but pull though they did with almost superhuman efforts the pursuers were destined not to win greg's boat reached the steamer while the villagers were yet eight minutes distant and he and the countess clambered aboard then the steamer's whistle gave a defiant shriek and the craft began to move away as she did so the pursuers saw a man suddenly leap overboard into the water pulling on they came to him just as he was sinking for the last time it was hal hartley and he was mortally wounded he only spoke once after they pulled him aboard it was to gasp out faintly she's doomed i've scuttled her then the blood spurted from his mouth and he expired while the countess steamed away to sea and was lost from view and captain gregg the smuggler was lost from the clutches of the law what was the fate of the countess is not definitely known but she never again entered the port of havre nor was a soul on board of her ever afterward seen the philadelphia detectives who arrived the next day found no one to arrest as those on whom suspicion could justly rest had fled during the night susie and hal hartley received a respectable burial at the expense of mr thornton then after paying fritz as promised the sum of five thousand dollars the speculator set out for his western home accompanied by his daughter and by griffith gregg who was to go back to the scene of his crimes for trial with his reward money fritz immediately returned to philadelphia and soon after purchased an interest in a Payne established business where he may be seen most any day when not on detective duty or if he is out his pretty wife rebecca will represent him End of chapter thirteen
Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah. Voiceovers by Kirk.com. End of Fritz to the Front by Edward L. Wheeler.